Thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for coming, everyone. We'll just get started in two more minutes. Everyone, we're now recording, and we are being streamed on YouTube, and in, once it hits 6.34, we'll get started. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Welcome to the March 7th, 2024 meeting of Queens Community Board 2. Uh, let us start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Okay, great, thank you so much. So, um, just a few notes before we get to our honored guest who joined us today. Um, uh, it's our first hybrid meeting, so we, we did it, we got there. <laughs> Um, and with that, some ground rules, but I will just remind folks, uh, if you are on Zoom, please use the raise hand function uh, and um, when you're ready for your question. And if you uh, chat someone, you will only get the hosts and the co-hosts, so just keep that in mind. And for all of us in the room, please let's follow the wait rule, W-A-I-T, why am I talking? Please consider if your question has been asked or answered before um, you ask a community-facing question. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to keep it to one question per board member as we go, um, and, uh, and five questions max, except for our guest who's joined us <laughs> to, to kick us off. Um, and the rest of the rest of it, you know, and you know, uh, and just remember, your vote is your opinion. So that let let that guide our discussion tonight. Okay. Without further ado, uh, please let's welcome our honored Queensborough President uh, Donovan Richards. Thank you, and let's let's give it up for your new chair, Anatole. Congratulations, or my condolences. I'm 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 so joking. All right. Uh, to Debbie, thank you for all that you do. And of course, uh, it's great uh, being here this evening. I just wanted to stop in uh, to give some brief updates, but certainly to uh, say thank you for all of the work that you do. I know community boards are volunt voluntary in nature, so you dedicate a lot of your time to our communities, and I just want you to know that we are grateful uh, for all your service, and I want to remind you that we're watching attendance, so please ensure that you are showing up if you're a board member, unless you have a, a real excuse, and Anna told to know that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to get through um, just some brief updates. So uh, we just recently closed our community board uh, process. We got about 841 applications this year with 592 of those applications being from individuals who do not serve on a community board. 
Now, I thought people were just bored when I came in as borough president and we were gonna see these numbers sort of get reduced, um, but no, it's, it's been hot. So it shows the, the work that you're doing. It, it, the communities are certainly acknowledge it and you're hearing it and wanna be a part of it. Um, so I wanna thank you for that to highlight the work of community boards. Many of the new applications uh, come from community board too. So you could be proud about that as well. And if you have any questions, of course, Khalil Bragg is our community board's director. And I, of course, want to thank your liaison, Claire. Thank you, Collins, who does a phenomenal at making sure I hear uh, all of your concerns. So as I always say, Queens leads the way in every aspect of the city. Um, I'm proud to say that in the, over the course of my th third year now going on as borough president, we've allocated more than $220 million across the borough and capital funding uh, to schools and parks and libraries, health and cultural organizations, transportation as well. Particularly brief highlight to some of the work we're doing. I've allocated $100,000 to Sunnyside Community Services so they may begin outfitting a new space in LIC. And I want to thank Sunnyside Community Services for always opening their doors. I want to put million dollars to local schools uh, throughout CB2 as well. As a matter of fact, we've allocated $30 million to schools during my tenure as borough, well, actually $53 million. And this year, uh, the largest tranche of my budget went to schools uh, at the tune of $30 million this year. And we're going to keep that momentum going up. So if you know of any schools, and, and what I would say is we are investing in the schools that historically have not seen investment. So if you know of schools that have challenges, we need to know those schools, you can get them to clear, uh, and we will look forward to funding them. A big thing I'm focusing on this year is hydroponic labs. Um, so I'm pretty much funding every hydroponics lab request uh, this budget coming up. Uh, on top of that, we've done a significant portion of capital allocations uh, to CUNY colleges in CB2, we put $4.2 million into LaGuardia Community College. 1.2 of that will go towards the construction and renovation of their science labs, specifically their occupational and physical therapy labs. $2 million was allocated to adapt their training spaces in order to facilitate hands-on education and skill development. And another $2 million will go towards the renovation of their pool. Um, a facility which uh, will address many of the safety concerns we've had there. And then one million has been allocated to the CUNY School of Law so that they may repurpose their decommissioned commercial kitchen space. Uh, we also put $1 million into the Court Square Library uh, for them to replace their current facility. And not to mention, I'm also happy to report that we put $1.5 million uh, has been allocated to Lawrence Virgilio Playground right here in Sunnyside. And then we also put $3 million into the Queensboro Bridge South Outer Roadway. Oh, yeah, I know I'm going to get questions on this. So let me just pull out my update on that. So I beat whoever was going to raise that, probably Laura. Um, so uh, updated project timeline uh, in May 2023, the pedestrian path South Outer Roadway is expected to be open exclusively to pedestrian for ex, to be open to exclusive pedestrian use in mid 2024. We anticipate the summer. All right. So I met with DOT yesterday on a myriad of different projects. Don't yell at me. Don't kill the messenger. I'm just I put three million in. I want to see my money spent. So trust me, we're just as passionate. Um, and we also know that DOT got a $23.75 million uh, uh, capital grant. Uh, and, and yesterday, uh, they updated us on where they're at. So they're doing surveys currently. I do anticipate that they will be coming to your board uh, within the next month to, to engage you on that process uh, as well. And we also put $1 million, uh, aside for 73rd Street in Roosevelt. So I think that was phase A, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, so that's money that, you know, we're, we're investing in transportation. And then just some other quick updates. Um, a lot of redevelopment happening at our airports. Obviously, LaGuardia uh, got some major investment, $8 billion of redevelopment money. 850 million of that, those dollars went to contracts 
uh, went to contract contracts for Queens-based small businesses. And now we are working on JFK, in which I co-chair the advisory board over there. And that is a $20 billion investment, 10,000 jobs online, 60 union jobs. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that, that we are doing there uh, to really bolster the economy, but more importantly, to ensure that we're creating pathways for our young people. Uh, on Monday. So we're really getting them prepared for the opportunity. For the last two years has led the city in housing production, but we have a long way. There's a lot in the queue, obviously, in LIC. We're definitely talking to the city about hundred units of real affordable housing, 15% set aside for what will be formerly homeless families. So I'm really proud of the work we did on that. And then we're working on Creedmoor, which as many of you know, it's been vacant, desolate for over a hundred, for nearly 40 years, a hundred acres of land. So we announced a plan with the governor to do about 2,000, almost 3,000 units on that site. And we continue to have discussions with the administration on that. And then also we're rezoning downtown Jamaica. So a lot in the queue. Um, and then I'll just touch on mental health. You know, we've allocated and secured $2 million for free mental health services. So if you know anybody in need, you can get in touch with our office. Uh, and then we also launched Urban Sustainability, Operation Urban Sustainability. Of course, we are pushing to make sure community composting returns as well. And I'm proud that Queens was the first um, to have composting in our city. And, and now we're working on the new zone program with the city, um, which will, I believe, go into Jackson Heights um, first. So a lot of work to still be done on the infrastructure front, and that is the highest priority to me. With that being said, I think I'll take a few questions. Happy Herstory Month uh, to all of the ladies here. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for helping God out borough. Um, thank you for keeping me in line. Uh, with that, being said, I'll open it up for a few questions. Uh, Pramit? And I'll let them call. If it's a hard question, I'm giving it to clear. All right, hi. Um, good afternoon. So I am speaking, I'm putting on my educator hat and um, something that um, I'm very concerned about is the deployment of the National Guard and more law enforcement. And so I work with a lot of, um, majority of the students that I work with are black and brown. Um, they're high school teenagers. And my concern is that they will be racially targeted and profiled um, because, you know, that's what historically has happened, you know, with stop and frisk, post 9-11. And so what is your office going to do to work alongside the NYPD and all these other law enforcement and military um, to make sure that our, at least me thinking about my young people are not wrongfully profiled and detained for whatever reason. Well, I'm a black man, I definitely understand that. Um, and it doesn't matter whether I'm borough president, it doesn't matter your title. Um, so we will continue, Juan, I'm, I, I don't agree on this whole thing that we need a thousand, what is it, a thousand National Guard in the subway system period in the first place. What we really should be doing is investing in mental health, right? And, and so I just think it's a, this is not an effective strategy in the long term because if they won't commit the crimes, all right, so you deter crime from in the subway, but okay, people will just commit the crime upstairs. So we're not focusing in on the real underlying issues for these folks, many of them in our homeless system, we're just turn, turn, spinning our wheels. So if you hear of any case, and I think that the answer to that question is we monitor that. I'm the former chairman of the Public Safety Committee as well, so I did a lot of work to hold NYPD accountable where they needed to be held on it. Matter of fact, my first vote in the City Council was for the Community Safety Act, and when I write a book, 
one day, God willing, you'll find out the backstory on how we passed that ledge. Um, but we will continue to monitor and I think just make sure that we're educating our young people their First Amendment rights. But, and I'll tell you, I've been profiled in the subway. I remember coming home from school and I'm getting on a train. Actually, was I work? Uh, no, I was working 14th Street at the time, uh, Union Square. And I remember getting on the train one day and I was profiled because I had jeans on and sneakers. That's the way they said you didn't have to wear a suit. I didn't dress, you know, I didn't have many suits back then. Um, maybe one or two. <laughs> but I remember almost getting charged with murder, believe it or not, because they mistook me for it. They profiled me first and then ran my, 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 my birthday and my name through the system. And apparently some guy in birthday and his name Donovan. for murder. <laughs> um, so I sat there for a half an hour, but I was really profiled just going through. I mean, on my way to work. So, um, so I, I will stress the importance of making sure that we continue to do the know your rights exercises on that. All right. Danielle. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go real quick. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Hey, thanks for being here. Good um, to see you. I would love to hear from you what you think is the out ideal outcome of the one LIC plan and process we have going on right now. I know we're in community input right now, but would love to hear from you what kinds of recommendations you think should be coming out of this. I'm not going to give what you should be prioritizing at the moment. I think when it gets to me is when the clock ticks on negotiations. But I think, you know, I mean, there are a myriad of issues, right? Infrastructure being a big issue. Um, there's always a need for housing. I know that's contra. I've heard that there are some folks who don't want to see housing, but I don't see how we don't build housing. Um, open space. I mean, those would be off the top of my head, three things. But we're going to negotiate and working very cl extremely close with Council Member One on this plan. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're going to want to see, I will just tell you, Queens get the money. We're going to want to see investments and not just sound investments on the new sites. I'm talking about looking at places like Queensbridge houses, right? That community center needs to be fixed up, right? Um, so we should also look at ways on how we can leverage it, as I did in Far Rockaway, to also invest in communities that are underserved. So that would be nice to get new shiny things, but we're not going to fix one, uh, build a new park here and leave parks in Queensbridge decrepit, right? So those are the things that I'll, I'll be largely focused on through the rezoning. Hi, um, thanks for um, joining us tonight. Um, my question is very specific about the Court Square Library. It's been closed, I think, since 2019, as you probably know. I know we have funding. Is there a location? Today, tonight, because we meet with Dennis Walcott tomorrow. <laughs> so once I get it, I, I will get an update on all the library projects in Queens tomorrow. And last year, you should know, I closed the gap on every, all of the library gaps we had in libraries in Queens. I closed all the gaps myself last year. All right, so tomorrow, we'll have, we can get back to you, clear. We can get an update and then we'll get back to you. And sewers is kind of the overwhelming issue that under, I know it's not sexy, but it underlies everything. And, and we, I would really ask if you as borough president can use your influence to impel them to, to come to the table and really give us an analysis of what this. And I go back, I'm the former chairman of the Environmental Protection Committee as well. So just a little bit of history. I was the first African-American as well and represented South Queens. So before you were seeing even the challenges here, people there were living with these challenges for 40 years. We secured $2.5 billion for Southern Queens. So we're gonna, we're looking at this with this, and I just met with the commissioner a few days ago. Uh, um, and we're only just, we're, we're looking at uh, as well, which is a big 
big issue. Um, so we are going to be announcing actually some news with the month. They just got they got some funding, and I hate the word study, but this of the study. Um, but I, I I commend the commissioner because at one point they were punting from really addressing water table. Um, this commissioner took them a little while, um, but as of last week, we're gonna be having some new, it's gonna be a citywide study, but Queens, I anticipate, will be the first place that they look at. And, and yes, they're gonna be mandated. All right, just another example. Far Rockaway, I represented Far Rockaway. We got $139 million in infrastructure capital money through that rezoning. So we're going to, so the. Thank you, Barbara. President for being here again this evening. Um, I'd like to begin with echoing Christine's comment regarding sewers. Specifically in our neighborhood, we encountered for the worst time in 50 years sewer backflows. And it's my understanding in the next three years with climate change, it's only gonna get worse. The last 10 months, we've been seeking a dialogue with DEP because we've seen work being performed, but no one's answering our questions or leaving our fears. How do we get DEP to have conversations with local communities such as the five nine five three five one nine? I know the number by heart. That's how much I deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can talk to Claire, and then we can connect. Thank you, Barbara. And that's not a problem. And that's a real number, by the way. Thank five nine five three five one nine. And then, if I may, Barbara, DEP President, don't just, kill me. I give out your number. Just short and sweet. I know the City Council passed a law as it relates to equity in terms of spending with DOT. How can we help? with communities such as Blissville. I keep on telling DOT, we want to get us off the list so that we're not on the list in two years about spending no money. How do we get DOT So to you're look gonna be us? invited, actually, I was talking about you yesterday, and I still gotta get some approvals, actually. Um, but we're working with the state. Obviously, we secured the downtown revitalization initiative through the governor, which I think is five million, I forgot how much. Um, almost, no, seven, I forgot. Missing the boss. Queens get the money. That's all. But so we're going to look to bring you in, actually, because I, I spoke of how Blissville is often left out of the conversation. So I look forward to that call. Daniel, you are. Um, that the institutional memory sits well here, and that at Five Points, the Walkoff building, there is a space with a lease that has not been executed for the library. And the letter I am I am have in my hand says. I believe we were close. Yes. They were close to signing the lease, actually. Yeah. On so right. that's mm -hmm. that's the conversation right. at the library, yeah. right? Tomorrow, I will have an answer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, we'll you. you can call me tomorrow. Hello, it's Hello. good to see you. I, good to see you. I, I would have rushed here sooner, but I, I missed the beginning. Um, I just want to bring up promises. I, I'm only allowed one question, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, arts and culture. Yep. In this community, um, LIC partnership in deals they've been making in the um, RFP that they put out that they just got the money from the state from, there's lots of promises about supporting arts and culture, and that's been happening over and over and over and over again, but, not, but nothing's happening. Um, you support arts and culture, the council members support arts and culture, but a lot of the new development, to your point, they're not, their feet are not being held to the fire. Um, Wolkoff is a great example of a promises being made through 25 below market. Ain't good enough and they're not even permanent. So just want to hear from you. Since Leverage you and we will ensure once again, and you know, I mean, people throw around the word CBA lightly, um, but just as we just negotiated a stadium deal, um, we could think about also having, just as we will with that, 
um, a long-term community advisory board. And that's really how you hold people accountable. So everything in writing. Um, and if there's the developer that you identify or a space that you identify that you think would be good for arts, once again, that's part of the negotiations of a uh, rezoning. So, you know, in some cases, um, we could shape uh, uh, what I call a um, community advisory fund. All right, so that's an example. So I hate, I keep talking about the Rockaways, but we also did one with, um, and we just did another one recently. Um, but, you know, you could get a fund set aside that can be community controlled, steering committee, as we stay away from it, but we want to make sure that it's governed correctly. Um, but, you know, I negotiated one deal, $2 million community fund. Right. So and that goes towards operational support for nonprofits, for instance. So it can be done. We're going to work extremely close with your member. And then as we negotiate with City Hall, because there's even dollars there, right? Um, could we negotiate with the administration to up some operational funding, right? So there's many layers to it, um, but it's hard to talk because we're not certified yet. But once we get certified, but and that's the purpose of, and I recognize the challenges that have happened before. I can say under my watch, definitively, that we're going to negotiate the heck out of this deal. All right. Thank you. Hi. That's you too. We talked about community fun. Thank you for saying that on the record. We are about to be best friends. Thank you, Sheila, for bringing this up. So just piggybacking on what Sheila is talking about, we are um, very much aware of the $10 million revitalization fund that's coming into LIC. So of course we have to talk about arts and culture, but one step before the promises that we want held accountable this time around is the selection committee that is currently in the process. You're going to be on it, I think. So, all right. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about you this morning. I just, okay, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, somebody who this decision is And we're working with LIC board. partnership and we uh, and of course we have to get approvals from the state. So we, we're pitching a list of folks from different diverse backgrounds, everyone from public housing to arts to small business to Blissville. Um, so we want to make sure that any organizations that or people who historically haven't been at the table have an opportunity to be at this table. So to to be continued, I think we're submitting our recommendations Monday, I believe. I was just looking at a draft of them and made a few slight changes because uh, we I wanted it to feel more community heavy. Exactly. Rather than developer heavy. Exactly. And, and you know, so let me leave it at that. Thank you. So, thank you for right. advocating to the state for us. It's really, right. really vital to and us. And I want to thank Ella, Laura, LIC yes. Partnership. Yes, Laura, because thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. But then to close us out. Welcome, Borough President. Um, I have a total different. I know you said you donated money to uh, LaGuardia for their pool. I believe so. I know there's a, so I have a question. How can we get our schools to be part of that program? Because going and just registering a child, it takes long lines. People are there. And the thing is, our children right now, we have a lot of obesity issues. I'm sure you know everybody. That. How can we get them to get more involved after school? We don't have enough after school program. That's another whole story. But if we're donating to LaGuardia, uh, their pools, how can we get our schools in the neighborhood, just not. That's a good side, conversation. Everyone. I mean, we, How, this is the I first mean, time this is brought up, but it's something we can definitely mention to him. And I think um, that the president, Ken Adams, and I believe he discussed that with me. He wanted to see a lot more um, community access to the pool um, when we actually did the capital funding there. But let me not I don't want to give you follow up, have a real station. That's great. All right. I've been there 20 years. So it's a great program, but I want the kids to involve, and it's affordable. I don't know if anybody knows, anybody has children here, people know. It's affordable. Yeah. The one next to it is too expensive. Okay. So and, I don't and, want to and we're short lifeguards, so we're focusing in on this borough wide, actually. Um, we're going to probably build four new pools. We're doing a Storios pool. It's um, over packed. Storios pool we have for as well. I got to do the locker room probably next. That's the next request. but. But no, no we're moving. We're moving in the right direction. And I was just talking about this earlier. The state also has the governor announced an initiative around pools as well. So it's something we're paying attention to, and it's something, quite frankly, even through the rezoning, 
like you should be thinking about as a community. Dr. Raz to close it out. Final answer. <laughs> Dr. Raz. There we go. Okay. I have a, a quick and simple question, but it relates to a project that we approved several years ago called The Barnett. And it was 100% affordable with income bands 30 to 80%. I live up the street. And we haven't seen anything happening. Is anything oh, it's coming. Like it's it? coming. What, That's the yeah. FIPS project, right? That's the FIPS project. So it's project. coming, and they actually did put in, and I just spoke with the um, CEO last week. So it's moving. And actually, they requested some capital funding um, from me this budget as well. So it, it is moving. I think I, you'll I see some so, news. I, I it's was not very hope. proud. Very proud. Affordable housing. Yeah, I think they're like many of the great projects, and we have a lot of projects pipeline for Queens, but they have to figure out the financing. So, right, because there's no 421A, I know nobody loves, we're, none of us were in love with 421A, but we got to get something done um, this year up in Albany. We can't. I, housing production, even though we led this year, I went from two years ago almost t a little bit north of 10, I think 12,000 units. Last year, I think we only did 4,000 in Queens. So look at that dip. So a lot of work to be done on the federal level, state level, local level on um, financing housing. But that's, that's the story. The beauty is Queens, because we have so much in the pipeline, like things are moving, um, but they're not moving as fast as I really want them to. So a lot more work to be done. But Barnett is moving, it's moving. It's moving. All right. Thank you all for having me. Happy New Year. Thank you, sir. OK, uh, moving right along. Now we'll take comments from the representatives of uh, Evelyn Lee. And and then is Mercedes, and then is a uh, cat. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Evelyn Lee from Congressman Grisman's office. Uh, today, I would like to just share a few things that the Congresswoman has been fighting for recently in the past one or two months. So first of all, um, so as you know, the mail theft problem has been a big issue. Uh, in New York, in the country, especially in our Queens. So we are recently, we were able to happy to, uh, we were happy to announce that the federal investigation uh, started by USPS has officially begun. So hopefully after that, they would give us some results, some, you know, in, um, solution as to how they can improve the whole mail the, the mail delivery process. And second, it's, uh, it's a reminder more like, uh, so the VA, Veteran Affairs, has, ex has expand, um, expanded the health care for veterans who were exposed to hazards and you know, a lot of hazards in during their service. So the health care, the veterans who are qualified for this uh, health care, they, um, they can start their enrollment starting March 5th. So that's already starting. And if you have any veterans around you, please be sure that they know that. And as you have known that the uh, escorts for a while, and recently the Congresswoman has led a lot of uh, support uh, from a lot of offices here as well, uh, like Stephen Rodger, the assembly member, uh, we, led a, we write a letter to the MTA and ask them, urge them to address the issue. As far as I know, unfortunately, the escalator is still not in use, and we are going to keep pushing for that as, as long as it's still not back in service yet. And I'm happy, happy to take any questions if you like. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Sorry. Oh, sorry, it's for board members. Um, oh. Feel free to follow up with her. Yeah, you're <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Evelyn. Uh, next is Mercedes from um, Senator uh, Gennaris's office. Good evening. Uh, 
Senator Michael Giannaris. Just want to give you a few updates. Um, first and foremost, um, we have two major events, um, one that's ending on March 22nd. It's our Youth Leadership Recognition Awards. So if you know of a high school student in the community that's doing great work, they'll represent to be a great future leader, uh, please definitely submit their information to our website. Um, we, our, the deadline is March 22nd. Also, we have started our Earth Day um, 2024 event. Um, we are accepting essays, poems, artwork, and short stories that talk about the environment. Um, the due date for that is April 12th, 2024. Um, please definitely provide your submissions. It's not just limited to students, so adults can be part of that as well. Um, my third update, we have finally finalized, and I will make the announcement at the next meeting, of our Woman of Distinction for our district. Last year, we gave it to Ms. Ann Cotton Morris, um, God bless her soul. Um, so we provided that at the uh, Woodside Tent um, Family Day last year in August. Um, next update, I wanted to let everybody know that um, the city has been seeking more red light cameras in our district. Um, the Senator has been in huge support of that. Um, one of the bills that he passed was this S-451, which allows the DMV to actually suspend licenses if they run red lights five or more times in the state, um, especially with a lot of the motor vehicle accidents that's been happening and hurting our children in our community. He has been a big proponent and supporter of those things. More importantly, um, he's been doing a lot of legislation right now, but more specifically to actually pass the budget in a decent amount of time, not like last year, he's really hoping. But he's definitely, yes, he's definitely meeting with a lot of constituents, a lot of people, some actually from CB2 um, recently, and he is definitely pushing for more funding and support for our education, especially our schools, which has lost a lot of funding on the city end. Um, just really quick to wrap up, he's also doing a lot of uh, work to promote more housing in our community as well as lower emissions from businesses to help um, air quality in our environment. I will take any questions. Hi, how are you, Tom? I'm well, thank you. Mercedes, not a question, but um, an expression of gratitude to the Senator. We had expressed a need for some TLC, but green space underneath the Kosciuszko at the yes. rear of Calvary Cemetery. Um, it's important to us. Thank you. The response time was very quick, and I appreciate the follow-up. So thank you very much. Definitely, and that's what we're here for. Please know that. Office is located at 4502 Dittmars Boulevard. We're open Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. You can also contact by phone. I left business cards over here for anyone that needs to contact our office for any reason. Are there any other questions? Hi, Sheila. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I worked on the center for all these years, removing gender discrimination from disability insurance premiums. Did he put it up again this year? Because he still did put it up again this you. year. Yes, he did. Uh, and uh, maybe bring up the health and committee here, and we can do a resolution because they have me having to define whether someone is male or female without any other options. And he's actually working ridiculous. with other senators in in Albany to try to get more support so that that could get like get out there. And yeah, get the Senate keeps passing it. It's yeah. the assembly, but David Weber's yeah. chair now. So That's what I'm saying. He's rallying in the assembly to try to be able to provide that support. We'll yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, Maury, uh, yeah, Maury's hand is up. Sorry, Maury. No, no problem. Where are you? Uh, I, I'm on the uh, oh. Zoom. Just Hi, a Maury, question. I'm trying to look at the screen, but I'm actually looking at the flag, but I'm assuming you hope I'm looking at you. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted oh. to um, ask you. Um, oh, there you are. Hi. Hello. So I don't know if you can hear me, but the question is just about the New York Privacy Act. Has that been reintroduced yet? Do you know? Yes, same thing, yes. So I know, like, again, he's been trying to rally in the assembly to provide more support so that could, like, completely pass okay. um, both houses. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate Any other questions? You're welcome. Okay. I'm going to give it to you. Thanks so much. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Catherine. Uh, oh, hey, hurry.
I'm uh, the chief of staff, Senator. First, um, and uh, here to keep you informed about the office. Um, and so, uh, first, I just wanted to talk about our G Train um, extension efforts. So, as you might know, the G Train is shutting down this summer. It's like the primary conduit between Queens and Brooklyn. And we know that this is an important, uh, this is an important upgrade that they're doing that is going to make the system faster and more efficient for everyone. And it's going to increase capacity at a time when we really need it for congestion pricing. But while they're doing this shutdown and while they're just making this a very difficult time for everyone, we want them to do as much as possible um, to upgrade the G train. And that we think includes extending it all the way to Forest Hills and making it longer, increasing the number of cars so that we actually have a full train, no more running for the G train. Um, and so we've been working with over 20 electeds to write a letter to the G, uh, to, to the MTA to this effect. Um, and we're also working, um, going to be working on more efforts to really push the MTA to make the most of the shutdown um, and support that. Again, with congestion price increasing, we really want to see, do everything we can to increase capacity on public transit and really make it the thing that people want to do and are excited to do uh, to make this, this, this work. Um, it's also budget season. And so um, in the budget, we have been fighting for uh, a housing package that prioritizes ten tenants and keeping tenants in their homes and truly deeply affordable housing in our communities. Um, we're fighting for funding for low-income tenants and homeowners to close the eligibility gap and enable them to access these green electrification programs. Oh, that's it? Oh my gosh, I did not know it was so short. Okay, I'll wrap up. We're also fighting for, you know, climbing, uh, climate resilience, art and cultural uh, institutions in our communities and community orgs that are serving our most vulnerable population. Uh, funding for health and hospitals. Uh, I think, as you might know, our hospital uh, in, in Brooklyn and a hospital in, in, in Manhattan are closing down, but we see this as an issue for our entire healthcare system. And so we are working for, for more funding and to make sure that these kind of closures can't happen in hospitals and this trend can't continue uh, in Queens as well. So, um, sorry, and thank you. All right. Oh, questions. Yes, questions. Um, Health and hospitals, uh, just today listening again and on the, how there are battles between the healthcare, um, the med, health insurance companies and the hospitals mm -hmm. and they're just cutting them out. Right now we have United Healthcare Oxford yeah. cutting out all of Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. right, there's Aetna's having a battle with uh, Weill Cornell. Mm -hmm. And so people are being completely um, disconnected from their healthcare and threatened financially. Um, so is there anything that can happen at the state uh, to try to, I mean, this is going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, so just asking for help. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real battle. And part of it is because um, in places in, uh, such as like uh, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, on that particular campus, a lot of services, a lot of staff is leaving. And, uh, you know, because they have planned on shutting down, staff is leaving. They've uh, been offered positions in other places. And so they actually can't. Uh, but no, so the, the, they've actually dropped healthcare because those services can't be fulfilled at those hospitals. And so I know that, like, that's in. But it, yeah, so I mean, I, I think what we are working really towards is making sure that uh, these institutions are, are fully funded and that they're actually uh, safe net hospitals. That hospitals, the other thing that we are seeing is like making sure that there's parity and reimbursement um, so that people, uh, so that, so that insurance, so that, you know, with insurance and with like Medicaid and with uh, tele, telehealth which isn't reimbursed at the same rate as in personnel. And so, yeah, I mean, we see it as an entire system problem. We see it as a problem with like this tension between private for-profit healthcare and with what, you know, health and hospitals, what our public institutions are trying to do. And so we really, yeah, we think it is a very deep problem that we want to work towards. Uh, Hi. Yeah. 
Um, hello, good to see you. Um, so different month, same question. Um, is Kristen working on revenue raisers or uh, AKA taxing the wealthy to raise some of the money um, that we need for many, many things? Yes. You know what they all are. <laughs> I'm not even gonna list them. Yes, and so, yes, yeah, so that is definitely a part of our budget package, was a part of our letters to the to the leader and of uh, and part of what Kristen is advocating for, or sorry, what Senator Gonzalez is advocating for in the budget um, is, is, is taxing the wealthy, is like yeah, making sure that we are prioritizing providing services over you know, tax breaks for- Because it would help with the health care issue. Yes. <laughs> Just saying, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks uh, for the updates on the Senator's advocacy to extend and improve the G-Train. I um, also just want to ask if um, she's speaking to the MTA about um, the, like, the detour plans for during the uh, construction when there's no G-Train between Brooklyn and Queens. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there will be shuttle buses, but they will not move unless there are dedicated bus lanes for them, um, specifically over the Pulaski Bridge. And also in that, um, during that period, walking and biking between Brooklyn and Queens are likely to increase significantly. Right. And so we will need an additional um, northbound bike and micro mobility lane and, and pedestrian lane on the Pulaski Bridge, mm -hmm. since the system is kind of strained. Yeah, so we, we've been working closely with, the, with other elected offices, especially in, in our North Brooklyn elected office, which is the benefit of, of, of having a, a multi-borough district. But um, what our understanding is that it's too, place that we need to, so MTA can, they pro, can provide buses, but the DOT, the city level DOT actually needs to do the bus lanes. And so we're working with uh, city level officials to talk through like what that looks like in a dedicated busway and whether, and what resources we need for that. We're also advocating for overall increased funding for MTA specifically to expand bus, uh, bus lines and all of that. And so hopefully some of that funding or the funding that it can also go to more buses, the buses we need for this transition. Thanks, yeah, I mean, we'll need this in general with congestion pricing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, thank you. Thanks. Maury, are, are you good? Okay, he's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any, any, any more for any more? <laughs> thank you so much. Two minutes, but next time you know. <laughs> no worries. Uh, great, um, next we have uh, 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 Tiffany Echevarra from Congressman Vel Velasquez's office. I'll try to make this quick. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you again. I am the community liaison for the Queens portion of Congresswoman Lydia Velasquez district. Just want to give you some recent legislation that the Congresswoman has been working on. So as an advocate for women's rights, last year she was the original co-sponsor for the Women's Health Production Act, which basically establishes the right for healthcare providers to offer abortion services to their patients. The Congresswoman is aware that 58% of intimate partner violence support that their harm doer monitors access and controls their finances. Because of this, she actually introduced the Survivor Financial Safety Inclusion Working Group Act. This act aims to increase support for domestic violence survivors that are experiencing economic abuse. Now, yesterday, the Appropriations Committee was finally able to come to a long-awaited finalization for the budget. <laughs> it's, been, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a while. So the Congresswoman was able to secure over $11 million for local projects for government funding packages throughout our district in Queens and Brooklyn. One very familiar facility that will, that will receive $4,050,000 for renovations and improved accessibility and building efficiency is Sunnyside Community Services. So I, she also has a whole bunch of other lists that um, she got funding for in Queens. I don't want to take too much time, but I will have these available for everyone. I'll keep them on the table over there. It basically has a list of all of the Queens organizations and in the back, her Brooklyn district organizations. For your convenience, I'll leave that on the table. Um, yeah, any questions? Yes. Thank you so much. 
My name is Tom Matusis. Yes, hi, Tom. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, on September 29th, Dan Wiley reported to us that he had engaged with Councilmember Wan's office mm -hmm. to bring infrastructure funds to the Blissville community, specifically for sewers. Mm -hmm. Want to know if there's an update as a result of that meeting and the infrastructure funds coming to Blissville? I could definitely get back in contact with you because I know Dan has definitely had some uh, meetings in regards to the sewers situation in Blissville, um, but I don't want to give you inaccurate information and I want to make sure that everything's super clear. I appreciate clear. that. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll, I'll get back to you for sure. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Anyone else? Okay, thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Okay, and next is uh, Victoria Leahy from um, Stephen Rogers' office. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Victoria Leahy. I'm the Chief of Staff for Assemblymember Stephen Raga. Um, currently, the Assembly is conferencing their One House Budget Resolution. Um, the AM is in Albany advocating for crucial inclusions like climate resiliency, infrastructure, and funding for programs. Um, to push back on the governor's uh, proposed cuts to hold harmless funding to our public schools, um, as well as funding in-district projects like the Alley Forney Center and the inclusion of the Mitchell Lama Repair Fund. Uh, we have recently introduced a number of new bills, one including A9051, which would require a study of the Guardian at, Guardian at Leadum program, which is a vital program that helps um, litigants resolve landlord-tenant conflicts in court. It, uh, the guardians also help litigants apply for social service programs that they may qualify for. Um, and what we've heard from a group of guardians is that there's severe delays in getting their wages paid out uh, and the need, excuse me, and the need for a wage increase. So this bill would require a study on the feasibility of expanding the program, a wage increase, and really understanding how how much work guardians add to our state, especially in uh, keeping our neighbors in their homes. Um, starting this month, we will offer free tax prep services to, uh, to constituents who make under $59,000 $59, or less. Uh, these will start uh, in the middle of March and run through tax prep uh, season, and they will be hosted on Saturdays. Once we have the final details about appointment confirmations, we will be sure to share with the community board. Uh, and then lastly, on March 23rd, Saturday, March 23rd at 1 p.m., we will be hosting our annual Woman of Distinction Awards at Elmhurst Hospital. We will be sharing the RSVP link due to limited seating, RSVP will be required. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Want to follow up on the state project regarding the BQE above the Laurel Hill Boulevard between the two cemeteries, Calvary two yes. and three. Uh, yes, two and three. We had spoken to the assemblyman about the fact that how are we going to mitigate the water that comes down the BQE into Wynwood Gardens area near 65th Place, where we had the death, the unfortunate death from the flooding in the apartment. And second, the water that comes down the drains onto the street on Lower Hill Boulevard enter a sewer system whose sewers go underneath the cemetery to Blissville. So how are we going to mitigate the water as part of this state project on the BQA? So there are two projects, one about the resiliency, but there is a separate project to specifically study uh, flooding and how water impacts that area. The last time that I spoke with the DOT, which was about uh, three weeks ago, they had finally hired a consultant on the project to better, who will serve as the person to understand the water flow in that area. Um, it took a while for them to contract with a consultant. Well, I, I appreciate that update, and I would just ask that you proactively update us moving forward as a result of that study. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks so much. Okay, next is uh, uh, Brenda Kinia from Juan Odile's office. Hello, everyone. My name is Brenda Quino. I am the constituent liaison for the Office of Assembly Member Juan Ardila. The member and myself hope that everyone is ready to enjoy tonight's exchange. With immense pride and gratitude, we bask in the afterglow of our 25th St. Pat's for All Parade this past weekend. This celebration not only marks the member's second march, it also marks a quarter century of tradition and showcased the vibrant spirit that defines our community. 
In Albany, Assembly Member Ardella has been meeting with labor unions, environmental advocates, and more, all while pushing for a fair and equitable state budget. He has signed on to budget letters that call on undoing the proposed changes to foundation aid so that our schools remain fully funded. 250 million for housing access voucher programs, 40 million for homeowner protection programs, 5 million for runaway and homeless youth programs, 200 million for the Child Victims Act, enhance affordable housing standards and prevailing wages to be included in any housing package that replaces 421-A, over 150 million for emergency food programs, expanding funding for child care providers and facilitating enrollment programs, rejecting cuts to Medicaid while increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates for our hospitals and more. Additionally, the member has signed on to letters to leadership demanding that the one house budget includes funding for the climate change superfund act 600 million for the clean water infrastructure 200 million in storm water grants 100 million for full day pre K programming tier six reform and other vital legislation that will keep New York affordable safe and climate change ready for those who live work and do business here. Our office is currently on the lookout for outstanding honor students in our community. If you know of a student who fits this description, please don't hesitate to send them our way. Our aim is to celebrate and recognize exceptional students, ensuring that they receive the recognition they rightfully deserve as they move forward in their academic life. You can email me at kinioB, Q-U-I-N-I-O-B, at nyassembly.gov, or you can call the office at 718-784-3194. Thank you. Oh, any questions? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Farah Salam from Councilman One's office. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Farah, and I'm Councilmember One's district director. Uh, this past weekend, we we're incredibly happy to have honored the 25th anniversary of the St. Pat's for All Parade with a street co-naming, and we also honored the organizers, Archley and Kathleen. So we're really happy to be a part of that. I also want to thank uh, BP Richards and his team for sharing the news about the South Outer Roadway. That was actually one of the updates that I want to provide. Um, our office is also providing $20,000 to ACE for extra rat mitigation services throughout the district. So if you notice any residential areas, commercial corridors with a lot of rat activity, please let our office know. Um, please also file 311 reports because we actually are using the data from 311 to inform ACE about where to go. Um, we also, speaking of rats, we have our rat academy training on March 27th from five o'clock to seven o'clock p.m. If you would like to sign up, please email our office or use the QR code that's on this flyer. I left one up here um, to sign up. Everyone who signs up for the webinar is eligible to receive a free rodent resistant garbage bin. It's for 10 people, so we have to choose at random. So please sign up by the 15th so that way you can be entered into the raffle. Um, in other programmatic news, uh, eligible New Yorkers with disabilities or who are over the age of 65 can save money on their rent or on their property taxes through either SCREE, DREE, SKI, or D. Um, apply now before the March 15th deadline. We still continue our CUNY Law Partnership where we host a housing lawyer uh, once every week to provide one-on-one -on -one constituent services. If you or anyone you know needs assistance, please contact our office. Um, and then updates on the Lieutenant Michael Davidson playground. Our office recently wrote a letter, or Council Member One recently wrote a letter and advocated on behalf of the community to prioritize the completion of the park. Um, Council Member One is the co chair, or has been selected to be co chair of the Black Caucus, serving alongside Chris, uh, Council Member Chris Marte, Council Member Crystal Hudson, and Council Member Kevin Riley. Um, Council Member One also introduced Bill number one, uh, intro 100, which would suspend alternate side parking on Losar Tibetan New Year. If it passes, Losar would become the 38th alternate side parking holiday in New York City and help us recognize the religious and cultural celebrations of 61,000 Tibetan Buddhists in our city. And then lastly, um, and I know this was a point of concern last month when um, Sunnyside Community Service was also affected by this, but Council Member One, along with Council Member Stevens and Council Member Aviles, has advocated to DYCD along with 38 other colleagues to allow City Hall's adult literacy RFP to have organizations 
open it to organizations serving tens of thousands of New Yorkers with limited English proficiency, including asylum seekers. Um, this RFP would allow people to access, access education, jobs, and other opportunities, and we can't allow, or we can't leave out 70% of the currently funded nonprofits who do offer free English classes from our neighbors with this um, restriction that DYCD is doing. So council member one has been advocating with her colleagues. If you have any questions, please reach out. Um, or if any constituent concerns, please email us. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, I read a report maybe about a week ago regarding e-bikes and the uh, lithium batteries causing major uh, destruction of property and death, and I would like to know what the city council or the council member in general is doing to counter the lithium problem. As you know, we can go all throughout our district. There's uh, shops set up to sell e-bikes, and this is a concern for me and for my neighbors. So this is my question. Yeah, um, so to my knowledge, and I definitely want to look this up and get back to you on it, but I believe there was legislation introduced to have lithium ion batteries be UL certified. Um, so that means they go through a rigorous certification process. I need to check to see if that was passed, um, but I do know that it was definitely introduced. Hi, so um, I just wanna ask you to explain further about the English as a second language RFP. So can you explain that uh, a number of organizations that provide that service were excluded from funding? Is that why you're doing this? So to my knowledge, because I don't work on budget, but to my knowledge, last month or at the beginning of the year when this RFP was initially introduced, um, it did not allow organizations like Sunnyside Community Service or Jacob Reese Settlement Houses to apply for the RFP which, you know, as we know, they've been doing beyond 100% in providing necessary ESL classes for our newly arrived neighbors and neighbors who have already been living here. And so Council Member One, along with her colleagues in government, uh, wrote to DYCD urging them to open up the application to organizations like Sunnyside Community Service and Jacob Reese. I'm not sure what the um, reasoning was for it, but I, uh, I can definitely get that information back to you. So um, is there something we can do to support that effort? I will definitely get back to you on that. Hi, uh, thank you for it. What? Oops, Roz then Tom. Hi. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on Warren's concerns about the lithium ion batteries and especially on, on e-bikes, the legal e-bikes. Now the mopeds are another story, but um, I understand that lots of apartment buildings are making co-ops, especially making rules that will disallow any charging of e-bikes in those buildings. And that's really very serious because e-bikes will help us reduce our you know, carbon emissions from cars and things like that. We want to encourage them. And so, um, but I had heard also of an idea that instead of, to, if we could do something to promote the idea for, um, there are legal uh, and safe lithium ion batteries, the ones that are certified. And if we could encourage those buildings to certify, um, you know, if you want to park your bike in our building, you can, but you got to assure us that the battery is certified. And rather than having a blanket, uh, no, no charging policy. Uh, are you, uh, do you think that the council member would like to pursue that kind of an idea? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can definitely bring that idea to the team and I'll share back with you. And I have to say I have to thank Mr. Hannigan in the audience for suggesting that to me this morning. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, for our two items, 
when we miss seeing anyone from your office at the last community advisory board meeting for the North Star Shelter in Blissful. Aside from hearing about the wonderful things that the shelter operator does for our most vulnerable, in fact, I'd love to nominate them to be the best shelter operator in all of New York City. I miss the fact that your office didn't hear, though, that even the shelter is experiencing sewer backflows. Okay. It would be important for your office to understand the extent of sewer backflows experienced in Blissville, inclusive of the state-of-the-art shelter in Blissville. So that's item number one. So I would encourage you and your office to attend the next community advisory board meeting. And I really plead upon you, we've been asking for 10 months now, a dialogue with DEP regarding the severe sewer backflows in Blissville, and it has gone unanswered. Second, on January 27th, my neighbor and I stopped a um, dumping occurring from two U-Haul trucks. Immediately reported it, and well, when we went to confront the gentleman dumping, him and his friends ran off abandoning the trucks. Reported it on 311, they closed it out. I contacted your office because I was dissatisfied with the response from 311. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, to this day, the trucks remain on 37th Street and Star. What is your office doing to help us with this issue? I'll have to check with the staff member who's on that case, um, and then I can update you. All right, and, and you respectfully, there's often times you tell us that you're going to update us. I'm gonna hold you to this because there's a long list of things that you have to update us about that right. I haven't heard back from. I'll be sure to- Okay, thank you. And if I do forget, please send a reminder email. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farah. And now next is uh, uh, Judy Zangwill uh, from Sunnyside Community Services. Hello, everyone. Um, I just to add to Lisa's question about the adult literacy RFP, um, DYC designated neighborhood targeted areas and most of Western Queens was left out. So it has a profound effect on Sunnyside Community Services. We, were, we have been serving 550 people, ESOL, and uh, Jacob Reese has, I believe, been serving about 250, 800 people that may be without service as a result of this. So there's been a lot of advocacy. Thank you to Councilperson Wan, because she really has taken the lead with this. There's been a lot of advocacy to change this. Unfortunately, DYCD really has not budged on this. So we're going to do everything we can to continue providing the service. Um, we are questioning whether we can even apply, but we're going to do everything we can. We've been, we've been fighting this, and we will do everything we can to continue to provide the service. Um, a couple of announcements, and I first of all want to thank <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> thank you so much. Congresswoman Velasquez is allocating $450,000. This was hot, hot off the press, right? <laughs> um, for a much needed capital improvements at Sunnyside Community Services and also Borough President Richards for allocating $100,000 for also much needed capital improvements. Um, I also want to tell you the good news, as you know, for the victims of the fire in Sunnyside, Sunnyside Community Services started GoFundMe, and we have now distributed all of that money. I believe there are nine residents still haven't picked up their checks, but I, for those of you who don't know, we raised 155,876. We have um, distributed anywhere from 1,000 to 3,133, and that depends on the occupants in the apartment. And as I said, there are only nine people now who haven't picked up the checks. I think we gave out a total of about 94. And the last thing um, I will say is that we are having a career day, and I'd like all of you to participate. <laughs> it's going to be at Queens Technical High School. It's April 12th. And I'd like all of you to come and talk to the high school students where we have a program about your career. And there is more information in the back. So thank you very much. Oh, yes. Sheila? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I usurped your... <laughs> Hi, Judy. Hi. 
Um, question about the career day, just, just in case other people have this question too, is um, are you looking for people, I mean, who, if they don't, if they don't have open positions, do you still want them to come? Sure. Talk? Okay. Yes. But. And by the way, the flyer explains everything, but you can choose your time slot. It gives you, uh, and you can, this is the barcode, of course, so you'll get all the specifics from that. Thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay. Next is uh, Asif Ali from What's Out on the Move. Hi, everyone. My name is Asif, and the uh, Irish coordinator of What's Out on the Move. I just wanted to highlight some of our work from the past month and some upcoming projects. Over the past month, we've been hosting a variety of workshops, such as Know Your Rights, Legal Clinics, Housing Connections, Social Services Programs. Every Tuesday, we have one of these workshops, and the next workshop will be Social Services Programs, and it will take place on March 12th. This coming Saturday, March 9th, we'll be hosting a food distribution in Little Manila at the corner of Roosevelt Ave and 69th Street, and it will start at 12 p.m. Uh, next Saturday, March 16th, we'll be doing a graffiti removal for local small businesses in Woodside. We're looking for volunteers to assist us. The following Saturday, March 23rd, we'll be hosting an Easter carnival at PS11. It'll be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The carnival will have a variety of activities such as face painting, Egg decorating and a bouncy house. Again, my name is Asif, and I'm with what's head in the move. Any question? Any questions? All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Fifty-six seconds. That's a record. <laughs> um, next is Adam from BSNY. Please. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Adam. I'm the Community Affairs Liaison for the Department of Sanitation. So as many as you um, might know, and if you don't know, starting March 1st, we are requesting all businesses to bin up on their trash. So regardless of whatever the business, uh, what kind of business uh, generates, they're still required to bin up. Now again, this does not reply to businesses that use loading docks or it does not pertain to recyclables. So they could still bundle a, car, a cardboard as well as putting any sort of recyclables in white bags. Again, this month we are holding info uh, sessions regarding the uh, containerization. Um, so if you'd like, I did leave uh, my business cards with Anatoly, but again, the um, info sessions, the next one is on March 15th and that is in Spanish. We have another one on March 19th, and that's offered in Mandarin, as well as in Cantonese. And, and then the last one will be March 25th, and that, that one would be in, in English. Uh, so any questions or concerns regarding these new uh, containerization laws, you know, be sure to either contact Anatoly, or you can simply just Google DSNY commercial ca uh, containerization info sessions, and, and that information uh, you know, would be available uh, for you. Uh, in the back, I did leave decals. So regardless of whether or not you do live in residential um, houses or apartment buildings, these are still very, uh, you know, they're very good. They're informative. Um, still people don't know how to, you know, recycle and se separate. So that's why we still provide, you know, these stickers for residents and, you know, landowners uh, to use. Um, any questions or concerns? I heard a first question over there. <laughs> the baby, oh, yeah, thanks. I'll take the baby's question. Oh. Um, yes. So, hi, hi. Um, our Environment, Parks and Recreation uh, Committee passed a resolution last April requesting residential trash containers. Is there anything we can do to get them faster? So that is, you know, that is part of our commitment and our plan that is, you know, in the future, we're still, you know, we're still working out all the logistics and the financial planning with, with that, but that is in, in the process. That's, that's already in, on the road to implementation. We're just, you know, gathering all that viable information, but, you know, first we just have to tackle the commercial businesses. As, as you know, all know that, you know, um, uh, commercial business, uh, private carters are now going to be separated in different zones. So th this is all just a part of our commitment of keeping your cities, cities clean. So that will, you know, eventually happen. If you like any updates, you know, feel free to get, grab my information. I'll be happy to share with you as the progress goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Maury. 
Hi. Um, oh, hi. I'm behind you on the screen. Um, thank you uh, for uh, being here. Uh, quick question. Um, <clears throat> I've spoken to some building supers uh, at, that were confused about the composting. Uh, and they, uh, uh, one of them said that they were told by uh, sanitation that they don't need to put them in the, put the enclosed um, container outside, they can just put it in regular garbage bags and throw it on the side with the regular trash. I think they misunderstood. And I went online trying to find uh, uh, things to print out to provide uh, them and in different languages, but I couldn't, I didn't have a good uh, experience trying to find. I found piecemeal things and links to pages that were outdated. Is there somewhere I can go or the public can go to download this information if they're not there presently with the with you there with the handouts <clears throat> that we can easily go to and download these uh, documents? So currently, right, uh, you know, I will look into that. Uh, currently, right now, you know, uh, you know, uh, multi-dwelling apartment buildings currently right now do have a choice of composting or not composting. Um, you know, that all pertains to the super of the building and the property management of the company. Um, and that is why we did set up those corner bins, you know, uh, uh, and you, you do see it. People do use it. Uh, they'll rather use that corner bin than deal with their, you know, buildings management company uh, regarding composting. Now, you know, again, as far as like enforcing composting laws, that's still, you know, ahead of us, uh, but it is, you know, in the plan, in the work. So right now, you know, it's it's optional, um, you know, and and um, further well, I, down the road. Just to clarify, yeah. the, the issue isn't that it's optional or not. They're trying to comply, but they don't understand how to. They were told that they don't need to put the compost uh, to be composted uh, in the container. They want to comply, but they don't realize that they're not complying. That's one part of it. I know that the fines don't come in for like another year or so. And the uh, the other issue is it's great that we have these compost bins all around now that you, the, the big mouth or whatever it's called. Um, the only problem with that is there are a lot of people that don't feel comfortable with it because it's not really being composted. It's being turned into sludge and uh, all kinds of other uh, biofuels, right? I can't speak on that. Uh, you know, we do utilize it. We do uh, create, uh, you know, uh, dirt out of it. Um, and we do give away that dirt that came from the composting, uh, from the bins and from the residential curbside uh, pickups. Um, again, if, 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 you know, if we need to speak further about, you know, how exactly it's being used, I mean, we can... No, it's been uh, well publicized in the news that the majority of the stuff that's being that's coming from those big bins on the corners um is is not going to be turned into mulch or dirt it's going to uh centers and then turn into biofuel and then also a lot of it winds up in the east river i mean again um i that that's not you know i don't know that to my own knowledge i can look into that we can oh please please that. yeah that'd like, be great thank you Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, on January 26, you may have heard me describe to the council members' the um, office, there were two active U-Hauls dumping garbage on 37th Street at Star Avenue. We immediately reported that via 311. Sanitation closed out 311, saying they will monitor the area. We have cameras installed by sanitation on 37th Street. I was expecting more of a response. The cameras would clearly see the act of dumping. The two U-Hauls remain there since January 26. Can we follow up on that request? Of course, sir? so you said Astoria and 37th Avenue? Review Avenue. Oh, review. Okay. I'm sorry, 37th Street 37th Street. and Star, S-T-A-R-R, -R, along the cemetery. We have two cameras there from sanitation. Okay. You will have clear view of what occurred that day. Of course, of course. Uh, now, you know, it's it's no surprise. People do use those U-Haul trucks. We do 
tow those U-Haul trucks and, you know, we deal with U-Haul, you know, paying um, you know, whatever the fine is to get their, their trucks back. So, you know, we're, we became good friends with U-Haul. Excellent. Yeah. So but, we'd like them removed. Yeah. But uh, please uh, take my contact because it seems to me that you're very, um, you, you know, you show advocacy in, in, in these sort of situations. Yes. So uh, I wish to have you, you know, as you know, a consultant for, for this. Uh, you know what? You have me, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Last one, Warren. Thank you. I can take you through a number of different neighborhoods. Rush Street, uh, un underneath the LIE, there's trucks with no plates. I myself have called. The only time I've seen anything done is when I send this information to the community board two office. But when I call 311, it's dismissed. It's put to the side, but the trucks, the vans, the whatever else, cars are still there with no plates. So I'm going to follow Tom and take, start. Take, take my We're going to do that. Because that is in one of my uh, purviews is abandoned vehicles with no license plates. So um, I do work hand in hand with other agencies, NYPD most importantly, uh, about, you know, doing these tag and tow operations. So. You know, please share, you know, uh, please. I, I, I will, trust that. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Let's become best friends, all right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our um, uh, organizational <laughs> section. Four speakers. Let's try to beat Asif's record. <laughs> uh, next, uh, Corey. Oh, and yes, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Megan Yuan from the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit is on the call. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Two minutes. All right, thanks for the shout out on the e-bike battery proposal, Roz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Hannigan. I'm the uh, active transportation program manager at the Tri-State Transportation Campaign, and I'm a resident of Woodside. Uh, I strongly support the proposed resolution tonight uh, for dedicated bus lanes in CB2. Anyone who's taken the bus in our district has probably experienced the same frustration I have when a bus full of you know 30 people is stuck behind a line of cars, each carrying one or two people tops. When the bus is no faster than a car, it's no wonder people prefer to drive, leading to more cars on the road, more congestion, and even slower buses. It's a vicious cycle, and the burden is borne primarily by the least advantaged. Three out of four New Yorkers who rely on the bus are low income, and a disproportionate number of bus riders are people of color. And as accessibility improvement work continues on subway stations along the 7 train, there will be more and more weekends like this weekend where Sunnyside residents will, in particular will need to rely on the bus to get around. But our buses are the slowest in the nation, averaging less than eight miles per hour. We've all seen those buses crawling through bumper bumper traffic down Northern Queens boulevards, but we know how to fix this. Just like the subway, we need to get the buses out of traffic. Dedicated bus lanes like those on Northern Boulevard in Jackson Heights, 21st Street and Astoria have shown time and time again to increase bus speeds and ridership, reduce crashes, reduce travel times. Um, all without impacting traffic volume or speeds. But CB2 currently doesn't have any bus lanes. But Northern Boulevard West and Queens Boulevard were listed as priority bus corridors in both the DOT's NYC Streets Plan and the MTA's Queens Bus Network redesign. This resolution would align with those plans, but more importantly, would help us comply with Local Law 195 of 2019, which requires the city to add 150 miles of new bus lanes by 2026. And we aren't even close to being on track to reach that goal. Last year, to stay on track, the city needed to build 30 miles of new protected bus lanes. They added roughly five miles total citywide. Let me just finish. The uh, DOT explained this in the recent streets plan update, saying that often attempts to redesign streets were met with opposition from elected officials and community boards. So let's show them that we at CB2 welcome these improvements which prioritize safer and more sustainable travel options at relatively low cost and provide alternatives to driving, which will be essential as congestion pricing is implemented. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Corey. Next, we have David Pambianchi. David Pambianchi, sign up online. No, OK. Uh, Manny Gomez.
Good evening, everyone. You will be asked to approve expansion of Long Island City Partnership B. It will sadly pass. Pat Dorf and I have only two minutes, and here, just for the historical record, that someone stood up for our lives and our neighborhoods. Why? We love Woodside and Sunnyside, and a Hail Mary pass is always worth the throw, right? What, what we ask for you tonight is tabling of the motion to pass, a real public hearing schedule. Those who know better and should vote know our village elders, Stephen Cooper, Christine Hunter, Kenneth Greenberg, Sheila Langwandowski, Lisa Deller, but they won unless there is a miracle. Their giant long-time advocacy for the community will now be overshadowed by tonight's vote. Some of the board will vote A, listening to those village elders, thinking that they must be doing the right thing. Mysteriously, those here principled to stand against Amazon suddenly have discarded local autonomy. Yes, a few of you will benefit mightily from further boom in land value. But the reason most will probably, along with others who know the real facts, have run into the giant wall of real estate money and power behind big expansions, which now runs New York City. 10 million bucks was announced by the major to go to help small businesses. It won. It is going to beat. If not, someone tell me that Sunnyside Chamber of Commerce will be getting $50,000 grant. Has anybody noticed that the public and the media has stopped attending until tonight? Why? It's because many perceive it's done and it's undusted, a formality, a done deal. We already have heard of the intent by big real estate is to join Sunnyside Shines, our bid to Long Island City partnerships into one entity, controlling Western Queens, as Derek McCall announced in 2023 to his board. At Queen Streets for All were described as being against all bids, untrue by Christine Hunter to this board after the mandatory public meeting. We are Queen Streets for All, the large majority of business owners and local leaders expressing passionate opposition. We were cut off and no one of our 50 handouts were taken. Do you really know about BEATS? We have assisted our BID and its executive directors, Glenn Jewell, Alisa Bonilla, James Bray, Rachel Tim, James Fibrillo, Bean, since the exception of the chamber. There is no reason to extend Long Island City Partnership. Thanks, Manny. Uh, Pat Dorfman? By charter, community input is minimal on bids. Some bids have brought neighborhoods out of blight, their original intention. That is not the case or intent of LIC partnership. Some bid formation leaders will make out like bandits or have a reason, like grants, to go with the sharks. Increase in their property value paid by small business and public grants is the motivation. Um, <clears throat> Where does the money come from to form bids, to uh, run them? Small business supports them and grants. This is public money. Um, my house has increased in value from 200,000 to 203 million. I can rent it right now for 8,500 8, a month. Do I wanna do that? No, I love my neighborhood. I don't wanna go anywhere. Um, I want Sunnyside Woodside to grow organically the way it was. I don't want big real estate to run, run us, which is what's gonna happen because Dirk McCall told his board that Sunnyside Shines, an LIC partnership once expanded, which swerves around the yards, will uh, join, which means we as a community, as small businesses, have no voice. This community board, community board one, will become uh, unimportant. Bids have one community services person that really is a, a minimal input that gets someone who go along. It's basically, uh, some bids are wonderful, wonderful. Our, our bid here was, and then with the latest person has become a little bit strange, passing a, a, cro a closing of um, the, the plaza on 46th Street, yes, it will help business. Not gonna help our businesses. Our bad businesses are, will be gone when the rents go up. It's already happening with three of them. Uh, anybody please ask me a question. I don't have much more to say, and this will be my last visit, I promise. Not one of you has some courage. Thank you, Miss Lisa Deller. Okay. 
our bid or, or Long Island City Partnership? Well, what, tonight you guys are going to vote on an expansion of LIC partnership. I want you to table that and have a real meeting because the public meeting that was manda mandated, we were basically ignored. Our handout, 50 handouts, none was taken, and I was essentially asked to be quiet and leave. Okay, so that's not a public meeting. We need to have a voice. Um, and I think if it's defeated, it's defeated. But we need to really have a voice, or it's not a real community meeting. So uh, I could go on and on about what has happened. We basically had a very good bid. Recently, uh, they had a secret uh, annual meeting. This is not good. There was no publicity. Uh, the, the businesses there were not invited because if people were afraid they would speak up. That's not good. Now, Long Island Partnership is not Sunnyside Shines. But we were told that they're going to join forces and control all of Lower Western Queens. That means, and you don't know this yet, but we've seen this elsewhere, that all of you will be irrelevant. Yes, one of you will get on that board, but you're not expected to be making trouble. And the last thing I want to say is, I think TA loves the earth and wants to stop private cars. I kind of get that. I would say, though, to go along with big real estate, Rebney, the Real Estate Board of New York, the most powerful lobby now running us, is the promise made, well, we're going to get rid of those private cars. Well, we're also going to lose our blue sky. I'm glad that you responded. Thank you, Laura. I'm just saying that please table this, have another meeting, and let us talk this time. Thank you. Uh, we do have folks signed up to comment on the uh, bid expansion topic when we get to that part of the meeting. So um, there will be a, a chance for people to, uh, for more comments on that. But with that said, let us get to, I think that's the end of uh, our public comments. Let us get to our board business, starting with the uh, ULRP at 5875 Queens Midtown Expressway Rezoning. Um, Joe, you good with the uh, screen share? Okay, great. And uh, Steve, if you want to come up here. Uh, yeah, sure. We can bring the mic over. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Did you guess it? Uh, yeah, I'll, I could hold it. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Sabaro, and I'm from Ackerman LLP, and I'm joined by my colleague, Steve Sinicori. We represent the applicant in this rezoning action, Lucky Supply Holding LLC. The project is located in Maspeth, Queens, within the Maspeth Industrial Business Zone. The applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an M11 to an M14 zoning district. This results in a modest change in FAR from 1.0 to 2.0. The applicant intends to continue its current operation as a restaurant supply business at the site and seeks to enlarge the existing one-story warehouse to a three-story building with approximately 162,000 square feet of manufacturing floor area and a 2.0 FAR. This rezoning will allow the applicant to increase on-site inventory storage, which will reduce incoming deliveries and allow them to accommodate larger outgoing orders. It will also reduce traffic in the area. The applicant can better serve its clientele, increase efficiency, and remain competitive in the market by maintaining more inventory on-site. So a little bit about the neighborhood context. Here we have a zoning map highlighting the rezoning area, which is circled in red. The rezoning area is located in M11 district. It was zoned M11 in 1961 and has remained unchanged since. M11 zones allow for a range of industrial uses, commercial uses, and some community facility uses. 
Uh, as I said, the rezoning area is in the Maspeth Industrial Business Zone, which is an area designated by the city to protect and grow industrial businesses by excluding new residential uses and providing targeted support. This rezoning would promote the growth of existing industrial uses within the IBZ and is consistent with the industrial land use patterns in the surrounding area. Here we have an area map facing from the north. The rezoning area is located on block 2656 at the center in purple there. Uh, it encompasses lots 20, 64, parts of 65, and 115. Lot 64 is improved with a one-story warehouse building and is occupied currently by the applicant's restaurant supply business. The rezoning area is located in close proximity to the Queens Midtown Expressway at the south, as well as Maurice Avenue, which serves as a key north-south corridor. To the north, there are Mount Zion and Calvary Cemeteries in green. East of the rezoning area is Frank Principe Park, which is an 8.9 acre park. We have C81 mapped to the northeast. To the northeast and west, there are also open spaces. Uh, and the rezoning area is in close proximity to the Q67 bus line, which services Middle Village to Long Island City, and the Q39 bus line, which services Long Island City to Ridgewood. Here we have two aerial views of the proposed development site. The top photo is taken directly from above, and the bottom photo is facing south from 54th Avenue. Uh, the proposed development, as I said, is to enlarge existing warehouse both vertically and horizontally to accommodate additional space for inventory, office space, parking, and a new loading berth. The enlargement results in a 20-foot setback. It rises to three floors and sets back down to two floors at the 54th Avenue side to the north. This zoning change map here shows the proposed rezoning area delineated with the black dotted lines mapping the proposed M14 district in red. This is a rendering of the proposed development from different angles we have here from 54th Avenue at the northern side. You can see the five loading berths for deliveries along 54th Avenue as well, four of which are currently existing. This rendering shows a proposed development from the Queens Midtown Express A to the south. You can see the entrance to the parking garage to the left, as well as the main building entrance to the right. In this site plan, you can see the existing floor area in green with the proposed floor area in red. And as I mentioned, building entrance and exits along the Queens Midtown Expressway and 54th Avenue. In this first floor plan, you can see the warehouse space in addition to the driveway at the left, leading to the new nine accessory off-street parking spaces we're proposing, which will also include four EV charging stations. The existing curb cut along 54th Avenue would remain, and a new 15-foot wide curb cut would be added to the south of the property along the Queens Midtown Expressway to allow vehicles to exit the parking garage. Here we have a second floor plan, which shows the additional warehouse space for inventory needed to accommodate the current business operations. We'll also have solar panels installed on the second floor roof, utilizing the large space we have there. Here we have the third floor plan, also showing additional warehouse space we're proposing and the second floor roof I just mentioned. This sectional drawing shows the setback from the third to second floor along 54th Avenue to the left. And lastly, we have a massing, which gives you a sense of the overall project looking south to the Queens Midtown Expressway. 
Uh, to summarize, the applicant is proposing an enlargement of the existing one-story warehouse building to three stories. This would be facilitated by a zoning change from M11 to M14, a 1.0 to 2.0 FAR, and the enlargement allows for additional warehouse space for the storage of inventory to better serve the applicant's customers and keep the applicant in business for years to come. The project will also add eight to 10 new jobs and the business currently employs 30 people. This concludes our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, what is the increase in the number of parking spots? So under the M14, we are not required to have any parking, but the applicant's proposing nine new spaces. There currently are none at the site. There are none. Okay, does that, ex so that explains the, okay, so in reality, there are cars all over the sidewalk outside of it. In the rendering, there are also cars on the sidewalk. Why is this? Uh, the rendering shows the, uh, I think this is the image, right? Yeah. Right. So here we had the, the five loading berths, which at the applicant uses vans for the business operations as opposed to trucks. And the sidewalk, I, I think that's just an illustration on the architect's part. I'm not really, I don't know if that's representation of what's existing. That's illegal. Right. I, I think it's just a representation of the drawing. It's actually pretty true to life. <laughs> Just pointing out. Okay. Well, uh, we, like so I said, we are proposing so nine are spaces. Any, so what? We are proposing the nine new additional spaces in the parking garage. Okay. On Google Maps, if you just look at Street View, though, it looks like there are 20 to 30 vehicles on the sidewalk along the facility. Um, do you know the relation of those vehicles to the facility? Are they employees? Are they coming in and out? I'm not exactly sure, but we can certainly look into that and provide a response after we speak with uh, the applicant. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hello, sir. As uh, I look at the rendering, 54th Avenue along the cemetery is traditionally an area that floods every time it rains. Is there any plans for, and I don't see it in the renderings, for any type of green infrastructure to mitigate the flooding in that area? I mean, the, the, the construction will have to comply with whatever DEP requirements are, uh, but I've, I've been listening throughout the night uh, about uh, flooding, and as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking maybe there's a possibility of putting some retention tanks on site, considering that we've had you know, some pretty pretty big roof space. Looking at obviously putting solar panels as well, but uh, given what I'm hearing, maybe retention tanks might. No, thank you, know. you sir, because I will tell you, or any type of green infrastructure, because I grew up on the other side of the cemetery and I'm very familiar with this block. And so for 50 years, it's been flooding. So any type of green infrastructure to absorb the water rather than it just being, you know, held back by the concrete that I'm seeing in the rendering. Maybe bioswales as well. Yes. Thank you. Maybe sir. some, you know. Yes. It would be appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Who we'll make a note of that? <laughs> Along similar lines, my new you're just by changing the envelope of the roof, you're required to do some of the greening, um, which is probably why you're doing this, the solar panels as opposed to a green roof. Um, but yeah, I, I encourage you, and maybe we can add it to our conversation about the, considering the flood mitigation, because uh, that's got to affect your inventory too. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I grew up um, in, in Middle Village, Mesbeth area, so I'm very familiar with what you know what we're talking about. I'm a lifelong Queens resident, and I I've gotten flooded, so I understand. But we we have a lot of roof space. So besides the solar panels, maybe there's a way you know bioswales outside, maybe some retention tanks. As long as it's able to you know to be aesthetically pleasing, there's got to be a way to design it. Uh, so we can we can speak to our architect, uh, and we're happy to keep the district manager and and chair um, informed of 
are, you know, what improvements we could put in. Do any other board members want to chime in? We have two more, two more speakers. Thank you all. Thank you. Much. We'll vote on this later. Um, anyone uh, 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 in the public want to comment on this issue? On Zoom or here? No? All right. Moving right along to the Long Island City Business Improvement District expansion topic. Um, folks, you want to come up here? Um, hmm. Oh, Henry, you got the, okay, great, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Rothrock from the Long Island City Partnership, and I'm joined by Angel, Henry, and Charles from the team as well. Um, we're here to present about the bid expansion, and we've presented a few times to the community board, so I'm going to really stick to the highlights and just cl some clarifying points um, that questions that have come up at the recent land use committee or the previous um, community board meeting, but of course happy to answer any questions that are more in depth. Um, Henry, next slide. Um, so just a one-on-one -on -one quick overview again. Um, a bid is a organization where property owners pay an additional assessment um, and it's a public-private partnership, so four elected officials sit on our board of directors, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, we provide supplemental services such as sanitation, beautification, holiday lighting. The bid was formed in 2005, which is the blue color on the map here, and then it expanded in 2017, which is the green color here. Um, that created a north subdistrict and a south subdistrict. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's it's one bid, and we have a total assessment budget of a million dollars currently, and that total amount is capped by law. Um, so our current board makeup, I know there were some questions about the governance at the most recent land use committee meeting, which I'm sorry I missed, I was away, but um, they are, our board makeup, um, is by law, as according to the bid law, um, the board has to be made up of stakeholders within the bid boundaries, and it has to be a majority of property owners, um, at least one commercial tenant, at least one resident, if there's any residents in the district. The four elected officials, which are the mayor, the city council person, the borough president, and the controller, as well as the community boards. Um, we go above and beyond that, so we have a number of commercial um, tenants here as well, and the way that the board is, um, the, the board gets voted in every year by the members, so if you are within the bid boundaries, then you come to the annual meeting, our annual meeting is public, anyone is able to come, even if you aren't um, a registered member of the bid, and um, each class of memberships votes for the board. Um, so again, this is our current board makeup. Um, so if the bid is expanded, this is what the, the boundaries would look like. Um, what we're proposing, which is really sort of unique to our, and different from our current bid now, is we're proposing what we're calling an east subdistrict, which is east of Sunnyside Yards, and that is in the industrial business zone, the IBZ. Um, and because the IBZ area has different needs and uh, different character of buildings and businesses, um, we would propose a separate subdistrict where they would have slightly, uh, slightly different services and um, budget, and it would be a subdistrict, so it would be governed by, uh, you know, it, all part of one board, but governed by an East subdistrict. Um, so. For the expansion budget, you can see here, this is what we're proposing. Um, the reason why the supplemental sanitation is so much higher in the east is because we would also, um, we probably would have to get a vehicle and do some of the, the carting of garbage or the, the schlepping of garbage um, because there is no, there's no residence in the IBZ, so there's currently no, um, sanitation carting there now. Um, most of the sanitation in the 
IBZ is really going to be targeted towards illegal dumping um, and uh, versus in the more mixed use residential commercial area in the current bid, which is um, we have the sanitation team out there that's sweeping seven days a week. You may have seen them. Um, but this is how the proposed expansion budget would break down. So as far as the process, so we started this bid formation, or I'm sorry, bid expansion process um, three years ago, back in 2021, because we heard from stakeholders outside of the current bid boundaries that they wanted us to look into expanding to cover the services in more blocks in the neighborhood. Um, so the process works is that we formed steering committees. We formed a st separate steering committee for the East and what we're calling the West because, like I said, there's different needs in those districts and um, went through a planning phase where we came up with the plan. Um, and then once we complete the planning phase, we go through an outreach phase. In the outreach phase, we have many public meetings um, and send out mailings. And we, the city requires us to send out a statement of support where we ask people, do you want the bid, yes or no? And in order to move forward into the legislative phase, we have to get at least 51% um, of the, um, of the property owners to, to respond positively in the statement of support or at least 51% of the assessed value. Um, we were able to meet those goals at the end of the outreach phase, which lasted about a year. And so now we're officially in the legislative phase. Um, and just to see how that compares, I know we got some questions about this, how our response rate compares to other efforts. Um, some previously, some most recent expansions were Hudson Square and Flatiron Nomad. Um, and you can see their response rate as far as the statements of support. And then also our numbers are higher than our expansion in 2017. So we're, we're happy with um, the broad based support that we've gotten. Um, here's to show just geographically, um, the representation that we've gotten signed from statements of support. I didn't mention that um, government owned properties, which we have a number of them, and nonprofit owned properties are exempt. Um, so we highlighted that here. Um, and then on the, the red outline is the, the current bid. And then you can see also we have broad based support from um, properties throughout the throughout this expansion as well. Um, also, residential, fully residential properties pay $1 a year, so they are not assessed at the commercial rate. Um, as far as our timeline, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but we've done a lot of outreach, um, canvassing, tabling out events, public meetings. The steering committee has also done a lot of outreach. Um, and here's some of our stats here about some of our, um, just the number of, out of outreach that we've done. And um, we also, we sent out the statement of support with the mailing. We had five public meetings. We also, I guess this is new since the last time we presented, we did get a lot of support from Community Board One, which the section along Northern Boulevard is in Community Board One. Um, and we've gotten a lot of press as well on the bid expansion. Um, so if this effort, moves forward as proposed, our total budget would be just over 2 million. So we're basically doubling the size, but we'd also be doubling the budget. So it's a, it's a big area to cover and we're, we have a low assessment rate. Um, and next slide. So as far as next steps, I mentioned we were in the legislative phase now. So we are a non euler referral, which means that unlike, I guess, traditional euler plan use items, um, there's a 30 day period for community board review versus the 60 day. We did have the, our city planning commission meeting yesterday, but we just clarified to them that the full board meeting of community board two was tonight. And so the CPC hasn't voted yet. So you're still able to submit a letter um, before they vote. If that moves forward, then we will go to city council. There's two hearings at city council that will be 30 days apart. And we send out a mailing to all the stakeholders, letting them know about that. Um, there's an objection period within that 30 days between the two hearings. And then if it passes city council, it would go 
um, and be signed into law by the mayor um, or lapse into law. Um, and we are we would like to provide services by July 1st because we're on a fiscal year and the city will only bill by fiscal year. So if we don't make this deadline, we'll be pushed back to next July. So we're hoping that with our timeline, we can move forward to start providing services in July. Um, this is just about some of our previous public testimony um, and some of the other letters of support that we've gotten. And I think that's, is that it, Henry? I think that's it. We do have a few people signed up for uh, comment on this, so I guess we'll take those before we move to Q&A. Oh, and there's a video as part of your presentation? Okay. Henry, you need to share screen with sound or, yeah, on, on Zoom. Sorry about that. As well as have developed arrangements here at the Yeah, we can move on. We can move on with this. Speaker, speaker. Basically, I've seen with my own eyes people going over and walking to the underpass and publicly urinating several times, not just once. I've seen trucks come and dump furniture, wood, just garbage under the underpass, and then not to mention all the graffiti. I had to clean up the side of my own building sites from the graffiti. And then recently, it got attacked again. Um, this is uncalled for, and I really just need and want the bid to go through to just help provide areas for um, garbage to clean up the trash that gets dumped, uh, putting appropriate lighting 
and um, making it a better place. Yep. So we, I, I know some of the uh, the businesses. Um, you know, wanted to, there was talk at the land use committee about like having some of the businesses come here tonight, and this one um, small studio she wasn't able to make it, so she asked if she could send a video. Sorry for bearing with us through the technology challenges. We have three people signed up uh, to make a comment. Um, Maya Brewster Dorian, um, if you just Hi. unmute yourself, and you have you... two minutes starting. Two minutes starting now. Oh, yeah. You can hear me, yes? That other thing threw me. Okay. Hi. I'm Maya Brewster Dorian. I run a production company called Even Dam Productions. We are in the Blanchard Building on 2110 51st Avenue, which is most access to our place, unless you're driving in or taking a taxi or Uber, you cross over the 21st Street Bridge. And the 21st Street Bridge seems like a very complicated thing to fix. So I understand <laughs> all the reasons behind that. But I have, now that people are fully back to work at the company, where we're about a couple hundred in that building, that's roughly 20,000 square feet. Um, no one feels safe after a certain time leaving leaving the office. So we are paying for extra security to escort people out because of lighting across the 21st Street Bridge to get either into a sub, to get into the subway or wherever else they need to go. Um, the, the veterans home that's also around the block, we have scaffolding that's over our place right now. So you will have incidences as early as four in the afternoon or five in the afternoon. So I personally ask my employees to leave early, but we are filming and shooting some days. So then I have to put in protection for those people. And the cost for this bid for me to pay is small compared to what I'm what I'm already accruing to cover a day-to-day life, a day-to-day -day healthy, safe lifestyle for my employees. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Maya. Uh, next we have Naveed Moradi. Naveed Moradi on Zoom. Yes. Oh, great, okay. Uh, two minutes starting now. Hi everybody, my name is Naveed Moradi. I'm one of the owners of Fabiana International. We are a family-run business, been a business for over 35 years. And we've been very proud and fortunate and grateful to be in Long Island City for about 10 years. Uh, in the last 10 years, we moved all of our uh, distribution and a good part of our uh, team over to Long Island City. Uh, so we own 3110 Hunters Point and 3116 Hunters Point. So we're an owner-occupied space. Uh, and we also have other companies who are in the space as well. So all in all, we're uh, just over 100 people. Uh, Long Island City has gone through a lot of transformation in the last 10 years, and I'm really proud to see of all the changes that are happening. I think this bid is just a additional improvement and an additional uh, benefit that we're seeing for uh, Long Island City, specifically the factory district, to continue to thrive uh, one thing that really strikes me that's amazing is is the fact that, first of all, you have a very industrial neighborhood that's now uh, combined and very close to residential neighborhoods. And we see many people from the residential neighborhoods com coming over to the factory district uh, to go for walks, to go running, spend time with their family. And uh, I, I love the fact that we have these two communities so close. So Long Island City is a place where you could work and you could play. Um, and you could live and you could raise a family. And we just want to see the bid to, to be expanded to our community as well, um, specifically for the lighting purposes and for the beautification and to just help uh, improve and to continue the path that Long Island City has been on. Um, we're very proud to be a part of it um, and uh, would love to see this bid to go through. Thank you, uh, um, Naveed. Um, anyone else on Zoom? No? Okay, great. Um, uh, Ejo, you didn't get to go before. I know you don't want to comment about this, <laughs> about the bid expansion, but uh, please come make your comment because you didn't get to go before. 
two minutes starting. <laughs> Thank you. I know this is a little bit out of uh, order, but um, we heard about the wonderful bid that the partnership got for our neighborhood, uh, $10 million, and I think it's really great. It's going to go to good work. Um, we are concerned about the arts and culture sector. We want to, thank you, Sheila. Um, we want to make sure that we have proper representation. There is currently no organization at the tip of the spear for arts and culture in Western Queens or Long Island City. There's no one representing us, and uh, we need some of that. We need to be able to come together. So what we're asking for is to make sure that arts and culture are properly represented uh, while this $10 million, we figure out what we're doing with it. Um, <clears throat> we would love to have a seat at the table. We want to make sure it's going in the right direction, and we're asking for as much transparency as possible. We know a lot of this is out of the hands of the LSD partnership, and we, we trust them, but at the same time, we really want to make sure that we're not getting forgotten, and we've gotten forgotten in the past. All right, so uh, this is an opportunity for all the organizations to come together. We're really asking you for the individual artists and the arts organizations to come together. Let's talk about this. Let's make sure we're unified, we're on the same page, and we have proper representation and transparency. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Oh, we're Col uh, Culture Lab, uh, Joe Wheeler, Executive Director of Culture Lab, LIC. If you guys don't know us, thank you very much. And uh, please come out and visit us. Thank you. Um, All right. Uh, questions for our uh, presenters from the LIC bid. About eight questions, 15 minutes timer, whichever comes first. Anyone who hasn't gone yet. <laughs> uh, all right, Danielle first. <laughs> My question is similar to the questions I had in land use last time. Can you explain again who gets a vote in the bid and how the elections work? And does the community board get a vote on the bid or do we just get to come to meetings? Yeah, so on the board of the bid, the com both community boards one and two are non-voting members. Um, and on the and then as far as like voting, so at the public meeting, which is held annually, um, if you're in, in the bid, then you get a vote on who is on the board. Um, so there's a call for nominations of people who want to be on the board and then a slate. And then if you're, so the property owners vote for the property owners, the tenants vote for the tenants, the residents vote for the residents um, to represent them on the board. Uh, thank you so much. In a recent article in this city, it described that over the next three years, we can anticipate experiencing 10% more rainfall. I was wondering if the bid would include, and I think this would be a wonderful thing to do, to benefit the community, is work with the city to increase rain gardens throughout this area and then care for them, taking water out of the sewer system, which overflows at a half an inch. Would the bid consider creating more rain gardens throughout the area and adopting them and caring for them? Yeah, definitely. We, um, you know, the resiliency and sustainability are a huge, um, it's something that we advocate for. We know they're a huge issue with Long Island City and, and so both the bid and the partnership um, wants to continue to work with the community board and um, to find out ways how to address this. So yes, that's something that we can, we'll definitely look into. Laura. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm not going to ask the question that I asked at the last bit expansion because I think I know the answer to that, but I'm going to say it and then ask my question just to get it in there. I'm hiding my, so I can't, the chair can't see him as he like shakes a finger at me because the last time I was just curious to know what the bid was doing for small businesses that are being pushed out since it's supposed to be about business improvement um, and they're kind of lease not 
trying to help them understand the lease, but just trying to help them make sure they don't get kicked out with gentrification that will happen with the bid expansion. So my question is, has to do with the board configuration. And this gets a little bit at what Danielle um, was kind of get, alluding to a little bit too, is I look at the board makeup and it says property owners, but the majority of the people are not property owners. They are representatives of property owners. Um, so that's a statement, but my question even about the property owners is how many of the property owners who have representatives on the board who do not have full autonomy, so they're not really property owners, um, how many of those properties are local and not global, or maybe have budgets under $20 million so that they're really looking at what it means to be really of and for this neighborhood? Do you have the demographics for those people? Yeah, I mean, you can see some of the property owners are from um, larger uh, companies that have properties. You mean the representatives, let's just be clear, those are not, majority of them are not property owners. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, also, you know, the Queensboro president isn't the one on our board, it's a representative, so yeah, we, he, we do he's allow. Yeah, but not the person voting. Like, well, no, the, the borough president, all the elected officials do have voting seats on the board. Okay, let's not mince words. I'm talking about the property owners who have the bulk of the seats, and you're talking about the elected officials who we get to vote for. I don't get to vote for your, your board. Right. So the property owners, you can see here, um, some of them are with companies that have properties or the, their representatives are with companies that have properties, you know, throughout the city. Some of them are local, um, cool. like for example, um, Wareweiss, Plaxall, um, Uovo, um, and they, so when we do, when we are voting on items for the bid, we have a bid board meeting coming up next week. It's about the services. So it's about, you know, tree guards or the san our sanitation RFP, et cetera. So that's, that's what they, that's the purpose of the board is to approve our budget where the, um, the services go and any like budgetary items like um, holiday lighting or sanitation, et cetera. Right, and they have autonomy from the partnership board, right? Yeah, so the partnership is a separate organization. So they're not the same people. Some, there is some overlap in, in the partnership board and the bid board, but the, the partnership is a much larger, um, ha, you know, has, has a, a different mission than just the bid boundaries, and the bid is really focused on services, but it allows us to keep our bid costs very low because we just focus on services, and then things like marketing or administration is through the partnership. Hi. Hi, Laura. Um, I, I would like to, I, I think I don't fully understand with regard to the infrastructure that's sort of missing and especially the lighting infrastructure, public lighting, you know, street lighting that seems to be very inadequate in the east side mm -hmm. and especially over yeah. that bridge which we walked over. How much, um, how much uh, ownership or, or what you what the bid can actually do in comparison to dot right who's actually in charge of the street lights can you influence them to increase the street lighting because it isn't just i mean what you basically do is christmas lighting right not actual street lighting yeah so we do the holiday lights that we do um we keep throughout the winter and they do act as a lighting source because they, especially in the winter when it gets darker earlier, we get a lot of feedback that it's really needed in the district, especially in the east where there's not a lot of lighting. Um, we've had to, we, we, some of our capital costs has gone to like wiring some of those. Um, but as far as like the actual street lights, you're right, that's different. So sometimes we can apply for, you know, we'll, we'll advocate for more lighting and apply for funding, um, but we, but that's more of like DOT. Um, lighting can you say in other areas in the past you've had success in advocating successfully for the city to increase its you know infrastructure budget and, and yes yeah improvements in yes so we yeah we put in um requests for um lighting and then we also work with the community board you know as, as far as our um, capital requests um and with dot and the council member um in trying to get new lighting and we've been successful um i don't know henry or angel if you know like the amount of 
lighting that we've been able to install and that we personally but have have advocated the city to install um so that's that that's definitely a part of what we do Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I think you mentioned it's effectively doubling uh, what it currently is. And um, l uh, more ignorant folks might wonder why now, uh, why this? Because uh, more ignorant folks might think that uh, the business district has kind of improved if it's Long Island City. Um, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the why to the question of why now, so it, especially in the so Long Island City is a, a rapidly growing neighborhood, as everyone knows, so it, the the population has increased dramatically as compared to the city in the past 10 years, as well as the number of jobs. So the population has grown five times faster than the rest of New York City, and jobs have grown twice as fast, um, especially in the, the IBZ area. When when people think about industrial businesses, they might think about like um, like heavy industrial people are driving to work. But what we see now is that there's a lot of businesses there now that are makerspace, life sciences, film and television. Um, and there's also there are some businesses that are also more traditional um, industrial. There's also office space. So with that comes a lot of foot traffic because people are walking to work. They're coming from the subway. Um, they're not driving to work. So there's all of these need for services in an area that has been traditionally sort of ignored from by the city um, because there's a lot more foot traffic there now. There's also a, a number of shelters there too. So, I mean, there are people living there. And with the more foot traffic comes, like I said, more of a need for lighting, for services, for sanitation. Um, so that's part of the reason why. And then also on the, the west of the yards, um, just with the increase in population and foot traffic as well, traditionally like the, the core areas of the main street were Vernon Boulevard, 44th Street, Jackson <clears throat> Avenue. Um, but we're seeing more and more on the sort of what were, were the side streets now becoming more main streets, and that's why there was a need for the services there too. Lisa, Karisha, and, and Maury to close us out. Yeah. Hey, hi, Laura. Um, this oh, is, Lisa. <laughs> hi. hi, I'm not on video. Um, so this is a very hard vote for us. I think most of the people, a lot of the people on the land use committee um, are, you know, considering the, the lack of services, which you just expressed yourself. This is a no man's land. We don't get the city services. We don't get the repairs. We don't get the things that this neighborhood needs. So you bring in the bid to fix up the neighborhood so that you know something happens <clears throat> to improve it and i think the desire here is for more right like how you know like fixing the bridge advocating for public services i don't like i don't really hear that in your proposal i hear like there's no Maybe you're the lead advocate for these services, but the bid itself isn't an advocacy organization. The bid is like a um, represents the the people with the highest value of their buildings there who want to increase the value of their buildings there. So I just my my question and to you is, you know, we the community board. I mean, why we keep asking for collaboration is we really want to see public services come back to this area. We'd like to put you out of business, frankly, so that if there were so many public business, public services in this neighborhood, we wouldn't need a bid. And that's what's so frustrating. And do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so we do advocate and, and as part of that, I would say, you know, dealing with streetscape issues that we do coordinate with the community board on. We go to all the district cabinet meetings. We send the three <laughs> ones. But, you know, here's a perfect example. So the, you know, um, Maya from, um, who was one of the people who talked, who spoke today, she said she was having a lot of employees go across the 21st Street Bridge. 
Related used to own that building and they were cleaning the bridge and they were they were servicing there's a trash can right there that's overflowing. And they were servicing it related sold the building and now no one's doing it the new owners not doing it. So yes, like I do wish that the city would do these services, but they're not. And so we she reached out to us to ask if there was anything we could do and we said, you know, when we we have the if we have the bid assuming we do like that's something that we could do there's i mean you see like garbage overflowing you know there's this whole notion of containerization and you see garbage overflowing in some of the the parks or you know some of the like dutch kills green for example like that's something that we like wish the city was doing but they're not and so especially with budget cuts like even though the the bid services are supplemental um we do try like the city's not sweeping the sidewalks or um you know servicing so the garbage cans especially in the ibz it is something that we think is necessary because of the changing nature of the neighborhood hi laura um so with your success in advocating for a longer term solution for street lighting to the dot that's been under the bid side right not the partnership side right. so i'm just wondering the the budget and thank you for the transparency on the budget but the budget allocated for holiday lighting is a little bit of a sticking point for me um, especially when those could be those dollars could be reallocated to making sure that the city agencies are working with you and working with the community board to get those lighting and garbage things addressed and maybe even more instead of instead of putting all of that money into winter lighting um, and maybe it could also be for like some of the snow and ice services or the sidewalk cleanings that some of the businesses who have come to these meetings expressed concern about or even just like cleaning the tree pits or something like that, um, which I know that is going or going to the huge supplemental sanitation budget, but I'm just wondering if there's any flexibility in being able to reallocate the holiday lighting budget towards more of the public service side, whether that means advocating or working with the agencies or you guys doing it yourselves, kind of speaking to Lisa's point. Yeah, so on the holiday lighting, part of the reason why it's so expensive is because we had to um, rewire some of the poles. Basically, this is a longer story, not to get into the weeds, but basically the city like two years ago said that all the holiday lighting throughout the city was not in compliance and you have to rewire. So it's a, that's a lot of capital cost. Um, also, holiday lighting um, is, I, you know, I wish it wasn't as expensive as it is, but we do hear from people that they do appreciate it in the winter, like I was saying, because of the lack of lighting. But to answer your question about the flexibility in the budget, so the budget is approved by the board and, like, as I was explaining, it, it's approved by the board and it's also approved by the membership. So if we're hearing, you know, money needs to be allocated to address X, Y, Z, um, we can change that. There is flexibility. The only thing that's written into law is the total assessment. We can't change that, but we can change the, the categories of how we spend it. Okay, so maybe what you're recommending um, towards the, the first question about uh, how we select people on this board is like, we can, be even more proactive and and showing up and having a say in who gets onto this board and uh advocating that way as well yeah and and also at our public meeting like i would love for you know the community board to come to our public meeting um and you know we're happy to send out information about our budget and if you have questions or if you know you can go through debbie or you can come to me directly about like funding or if there's need that we're not addressing then we're we're happy to address it Great. okay thank you Maury. Um, hi, thank you, Anatole. Hi, it's nice to see you. Um, I know there's been a long process. I'm behind you on the screen, I think. Um, so I know there's been a long process. I was there with you, which seems like a year ago, and maybe it was almost a year ago when we went across the bridge and all that. Um, <clears throat> I, I still have a lot of questions. I feel there's a lot of things that haven't been answered for me. I think some of them have been answered, and unfortunately, they they the answers I get um, for myself is that we're n I don't understand the point of the bid. Um, I know that originally the point of bids was to take blighted areas, like Christine was saying, 
Uh, they started out in Canada, and then they got um, popular in the United States. And they take areas where there was nobody around and there was very few businesses, very few residents. Um, and there was just a lot of garbage and a lot of um, uh, it was a way for uh, businesses to come together, property owners to try to take care of it. Um, now we have an area like Long Island City, which is booming and doing wonderfully. Um, and all of the people that have been kind of paraded through obviously have been cherry picked to support your argument. I understand that that's the way people get things through. But I think a lot of people are failing to understand some of the basics of all of this, which is, you know, by your own comments at some of the meetings and even tonight, you contact the community board, you get uh, us to put into our budget monies. Um, and at one point when we talked to um, I met with Bryce, I mean, Boyce, we talked about the idea how businesses and property owners are being double taxed. And he said, you know, I didn't, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, we are being double taxed. Um, but I'm okay with paying that. And of course he's okay with paying it. You know, they're, they're probably worth, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars and they can afford it. My concern is <clears throat> with a lot of the, the things you've talked about, it's, there are, you don't have the power or the control to be able to do it. And when we look at the budget, we see what most of it, and I don't have a beef with the Long Island City Partnership or the bid, it's a, it's a fundamental problem with the way the city is structuring things. So basically we're taxing businesses, we're putting an a impact on the entire um, community uh, uh, and we call it gentrification. We saw in um, uh, Jackson Heights, they several years back, um, voted down, the, the community board voted down, and they didn't expand uh, the bid there because of real concerns about um, gentrification that was going to lead to people being displaced. Um, and now we're looking at an area that's, of course, industrial on the east side, which not a lot of people living there that are going to get displaced. But overall, if we continue to increase rents, increase money, make things um, uh, uh, so gentrified that people can't afford to live, where are they going to live? And I think um, I, we didn't see a lot of answers to that. And when we look at the, the budgets, we see that most of it's for garbage and cleanup. Those are things that businesses should be paying for for themselves. And the, the, the question I have about the East Side is that my big concern about that is this is a decision that's not reversible. Once you get it, it's expanded and it's done. And I know we spent a lot of time looking at this and we've had, but all of the conversations, um, most of the conversations have been, you know, kind of the same thing over and over. Somebody, businesses come in and say, oh, it's dirty or the bridge is unsafe. And, you know, the answers are always the same. Um, we're going to call the community board. We're going to advocate for this. We're going to pay for some garbage cleanup. Um, but we still can't, you know, and then we're going to get lighting, but then we find out the lighting is really Christmas lighting, that you can't really do anything about the lighting or pay for security in an area. Um, so I feel like a lot of the business and property owners have a misunderstanding of what actually is going to be done uh, and what they're getting for this. Um, and then on the east side, and I've talked to small businesses who are very much against it and because they're busy and small businesses, they don't have the luxury of coming to the meetings, unfortunately. Some have, I think, reached out. But one of my concerns about the east side is it's pretty empty right now. And since it's empty, um, ultimately, we the hope is that there will be businesses there, right? So eventually, there are going to be businesses there. So those businesses, especially small businesses, who are going to be affected by the bid and there's going to be assessments and costs and things like that. Um, it's going to make rents go up eventually. They have no say in it because they don't exist yet. They're not there. So we're kind of like putting the cart before the horse. We're voting on an expansion before there's really enough businesses there to expand. Maury, I'm so sorry. Time. The question, please. Sorry. Well, I, I just to address, I guess the the about not business not being there so in the east there's 139 buildings and out of those 139 nine of them um 
don't have tenants. So I, I wouldn't describe it as like, you know, not having businesses there. On the, on the west side, the, our vacancy rate in the current bid is about 9%, which is lower than the city um, average and lower than most bids. Um, but of course, you know, we, we also do business assistance services and, um, and help businesses by helping them identify space, et cetera. So, you know, we haven't heard the concerns from, from businesses. We've had a lot of outreach. We've had five public meetings plus the community board meetings and the mailings, et cetera. And we just haven't heard, um, you know, a lot of opposition. We've only, the only really responses that we've been getting is like, can you also include our area? So during this process, the boundaries actually got bigger because we heard from people that they also wanted to be included. So, you know, we, we don't want to, of course, expand this bid if it's not wanted by the, by the businesses and by the property owners, but we just haven't heard that. Well, I guess We've my the opposite. Sorry for going on for so long, but I guess my big, real question is how many of the businesses that you've spoken to and other businesses um, understand that there already are ways to deal with the sanitation and the problems? Just like you come to the community board, they can come directly to the community board. So why go through a middleman? I guess that's my question. Yeah, no, they, they understand. I mean, as far as the sanitation services, which is most of the services that we provide, um, the city's not, like I said, the city's not sweeping the sidewalks and um, or doing the holiday lighting or doing the hanging baskets or the horticulture programs that we're doing. So it's not th those direct services. Like some of it is the advocacy piece, but a lot, most of what we're doing is um, really around direct services that the city does not provide. So we're spending, so we're basically. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta, it's nine o'clock, we, we have to take attendance. <laughs> uh, do you wanna wrap up, Maury? No, 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 I'll just leave it to the discussion. All right, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Sorry, everybody. No, it's all valid, all good talk, just we got to be out of here by 10, 15. So <laughs> that's an hour and 15 minutes from here. I believe we can do it. Um, let's move on to board business and attendance. Secretary's not here, so uh, I will take attendance. Uh, Amparo Applebay. Thank you. Nelly Ashfar, I do see you on Zoom. But you do not count to quorum, but you can vote and you can have, be participated of the discussion. Uh, Anatole Asheroff, John Bahia, Anne Marie Barakowski, Carisha Baton, Nick Berkowitz, Kat Bloomfield is excused, Daniel Brecker, Carlos Castile Croak. Great, thank you. Uh, Tanya Chavez, same, I see you on Zoom and you are present you can vote and you can participate in discussion you just don't count to quorum osmond chowdhury steve cooper excused and out kelly craig absent warren davis lisa della maury gallinoy same for you somnath gamir uh, absent Dr. Roz Giannousis, thank you. Camille Gray, thank you. Kenny Greenberg, great, thank you. Mohammed Hosin, oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, Christine Hunter, Leland Kendall, Patron Khan, Diana Ketchler, absent, excused. Prameet Kumar, Chimel Chimamang Lama. Thank you. Sorry. Sheila Lewandowski. Benjamin Lucas. Benjamin Lucas. Absent. Patrick Martinez. Tom Matusitz. Thank you. Eric Narberg. Thank you. Zee Shanat. Riley Owens. Omaya Saab, you uh, are here and counted as part of quorum. You want to just unmute and Omaya Saab? I'm here. Thank you. Roberto Saldana. Thank you. Laura Shepard. Thank you. Ryan Smith is excused. 
Caroline Spitzer is excused. Lauren Springer. Punchak Tashi. Absent. Agnello Thomas. Evening. Thank you. Mary Torres is excused and out for illness. Leticia Vasquez. Thank you. Cal Sang Yangso. Absent. And yes, we have a quorum in person. Awesome. First hybrid meeting, first quorum. We did it. <laughs> Big round of applause. <laughs> <I congratulate all. laughs> and we set a standard for Queens community boards because nobody else is doing it yet. So we're the first. Woo um, uh, approval of the minutes for February. Show of hands. Uh, But we voted on it. So, so that, is that incorrect in the minutes, or? Okay. Okay. So we'll, can we, can we um, uh, approve it with that condition? Okay. Revise and we'll vote on it next month. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, and now it's time for Chairperson's report. Okay, uh, I have three things. First two is gonna be rounds of applause. So first one is um, thank you uh, Warren and uh, Tanya and some of isn't here today for pulling off a very successful CB2 code drive. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, on uh, uh, February 24th, we partnered with the GPK Foundation, which is uh, some not's other organization, to deliver um, 15 bags of um, uh, coats, socks, winter gear, um, and uh, people came through. They did the right thing. They uh, uh, do you want? Do you want to talk a little bit about it, Warren? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I cannot take any credit for this. This is uh, Tanya, and this is Tonov. Um, doing all the hard work. They're the ones that raised the coats. So I'm not gonna take any credit. I was just the one-way sign of who to give the coats to. There were some stipulations that we could not give any of the items to the shelters because of whatever reasons. Um, but St. Raphael Church was very glad to receive the items and the people in the community who come, which are mostly migrants, to get um, food as well as clothing. We're very appreciative, very, very appreciative. So, Thank you, Community Board 2 as a whole, and in particular, Tanya and Sona for the hard work that they did. I just assisted them in the hard work. Thank you. Tanya, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, thank you, Warren. He covered everything. I just want to thank everyone who supported us, uh, Debbie, you, and uh, Sunny Sunshines, Woodside on the Moods, GTK Foundation and Council Member One, who helped us, uh, who partnered with us to make this again a successful drive. That's all. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. And uh, next is St. Pat's for All. Thank you for the great showing. Um, it was great to see a, a whole bunch of you. Uh, thank you for. Um, Where's Eric? Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, 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 Pai. Thank you. Um, uh, Raz and Paro, uh, uh, Krish doing double duty, you know, <laughs> you, you swung by, you were there, <laughs> you did double duty, um, and yeah, uh, and, and uh, uh, past and uh, uh, Ben Gutman joined us, so that was pretty cool, and uh, hopefully a couple of future board members who are in this room. Um, and lastly for me, just, uh, you know, uh, it's Biden's State of the Union, so I thought I want to do my State of the Union. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to check in. It's, I, I've been chair for three months. Um, thank you again for the vote of confidence. Um, follow up with me later. I'm not fishing for compliments right now, but <laughs> you know, I, I, I know there was a lot um, I wanted to accomplish as chair, and we wanted to accomplish with me as chair. So, you know, uh, some of the committee assignments we got done, committee, you know, chairs and um, 
members uh, got our first hybrid meeting done. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've been blowing up your emails more often than not. So uh, um, there's a lot more to do. There's an onboarding document I talked about, and, and but that'll wait till, you know, let's wait till the new members are here and we'll get that all done together. Um, and yeah, much more to do. But um, yeah, we, we got some big and little things done uh, together as a board. So round of applause to all of us. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, uh, Debbie, you're up. Wow, we're all working together. It's really nice, and I'm, I want to thank Mark and his team. I want to thank the technology team, and I told Patrick, uh, there's a lot of people, the executive board, for meeting and having this discussion to get this very successful. Sunnyside Community Services, you rock. So thank you very much to them as well. They are amazing, and their technology team really just came together for tonight. So. I can't thank everybody enough. My staff, Marianne and Kim, um, are terrific. On that note, I will let you all know we have a new intern from LaGuardia College that just started Monday, um, Emile. Um, she uh, comes from LaGuardia, and she's a lovely young lady, and uh, I think she's going to do a great job. So if you hear a young voice and someone answering the phone, you'll know it's our intern being trained. So that'll be terrific. So we welcome her. Um, the 108 Precinct Council meeting is uh, March 26th at 7 p.m. here at Sunnyside Community Services. Um, we also have on our website the NCO Build a Block meetings for the month of March. So if you want to go look at the dates and times, it is on our website. Uh, remember, if you have complaints, they're not getting responded, call the office, send us an email. We will follow up. Um, as Maury alluded to, I do have a district service cabinet meeting once a month um, with all of our agencies. The bids, Sunnyside Shines, the partnership are invited guests. Let me be clear, they are not mandatory, not by the charter. Only city agencies are. Um, if they have a problem and a question, we do invite them to help us uh, articulate their issue and get it on the record so that they don't go around the community board that we get the record of some of the issues that we work on together as partnerships. <laughs> so we do that for the good of the entire district. Uh, we only had, and I say only because uh, February must have been a very cold light month and I think we had some bad weather and so we had a lot of duplicate complaints about some some snow shoveling, but our top complaints were from sanitation, transportation, and parks. Um, and we had only 12 this month, um, but some of them are for follow-up. And some of them are duplicates, so we don't report the duplicates. So we just report an initial complaint. Um, as you heard from sanitation, March 1st, businesses must use the new bins. So um, just let us know if you need anything. and. Uh, our uh, next meeting, I uh, want to wish everybody happy St. Patrick's Day, happy Easter, Women's History Month, and uh, the next meeting is Thursday, April 4th, here at Sunnyside Community Services. Anybody have any questions? Happy Ramadan. Oh, happy Ramadan, absolutely. Happy Ramadan. Okay, um, uh, city planning? Good evening, my name is Bree Mejia. I'm from the New York City Department of City Planning. Um, so I'm just gonna be brief. We have some updates regarding City of Yes um, with uh, the zoning for economic uh, proposal having passed already. Um, we can now focus on what's coming, which is a housing opportunity. Um, this is scheduled uh, to go to public review in the spring. So very soon, um, and if it's approved, it's expected to be brought to the city council for a vote by the end of this year. So we highly encourage you to keep attending the informational sessions that we've scheduled once a month. Uh, the next one is on March 27th. Um, it's gonna cover the missing middle, uh, different housing types. Um, and then following that one, the next one would be in April, 
on April 17th. Um, our information for these um, for these sessions are on our website. I can forward you the email if you'd like. You can register online. You can also access them uh, directly on YouTube. They'll be stored there if you can't access them uh, on the day uh, that they are being uh, hosted. Um, we also have many resources online. I encourage you to take a look at those um, before referral so you can kind of get an idea of what it all covers. Um, and also feel, feel free to uh, directly email our housing team. Uh, that email is housingopportunity at planning.nyc.gov. I can also share this with you um, a bit later if you'd like. And uh, next regarding our study. A one LIC plan. Um, we're currently in the process of organizing the next town hall meeting. Um, in the meantime, we're collecting and analyzing all the data from the previous focus area meetings um, and preparing uh, materials for the next round of focus area meetings, which would be round three. Um, the next town hall meeting uh, will be at Jacob Breeze Settlement Center once again. This is to conclude the se second round of focus area meetings. And with that, I open to questions. There is currently not a date. Um, we are waiting for a date confirmation from uh, Julie Wan. So um, stay tuned or um, also feel free to directly reach out to, to Julie. Perhaps she'll have an update for you. Hi. So now that City of Yes has gone through, uh, when, when did that when did that pass? By the way, last week or so. Okay. So um, what now happens to all of the comments that we were asked to submit per amendment? Um, like, how does that now get into how does that now get taken into consideration and not just blown over because it's been passed as a package? I believe right before coming here we actually got an email with that exact information so i can connect with you directly um, and share that with you because there is um, so there's a process in place in order to go through each point of concern and incorporate it and then is there another iteration of voting to pass like that next draft of city of yes or how does I that will work? double check especially with this the information that i'm talking about that we just got in the email um so i can share what's accurate with you okay thank you no problem okay thank you all right um I'm going to mess with things right now. Uh, first, you know, let's skip the uh, committee reports. Well, you know, <laughs> we got four things to go through. Uh, I would like to do the hopefully easy votes first. <laughs> um, starting with, uh, so let's go transportation, then the land use votes, you know, with the ULERP, the uh, 2310, and let's save, uh, sorry, you're staying for a while. <laughs> uh, the, the big one for the end. So, um, Riley. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, I appreciate the work that Tom and Sheila have done before me. Um, that was a pleasure to be on the um, committee with them, and I hope to continue the great work. Uh, we had a very, very easy motion at our February meeting. The MTA had presented the proposed final plan for the Queen's um, bus network, um, redo, um, and uh, within the documentation there, there was uh, a plan to highlight um, corridors within our district that needed bus priority, and we um, made a, a motion for, sorry, I haven't been in front of you guys before. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I used to do improv, uh, this is different. Um, to support the um, study on Queens Boulevard and Northern Boulevard West, uh, which seemed like very, very easy things to do. 
within the plan, it just says that there will be study for bus priority on these corridors. So the motion was to support dedicated bus lanes onto priority corridor, corridors identified within CB2 by the MTA in the Queens Bus Network redesign, Northern Boulevard West and Queens Boulevard. And in addition, to study the implementation of dedicated bus infrastructure or bus lanes on the Long Island Expressway in the Queens Midtown Tunnel and on the Queensboro Bridge. Um, is this seconded? Motion uh, voted. Was that, that was the motion, right? That was the motion that right. passed <laughs> unanimously in the committee and the same motion being made to the full board tonight. And it was sent to everybody. This and it was sent to everybody. Uh, motion to call. Yep. <laughs> Call the question. Yeah, show of hands to support the motion. Show of hands. Tanya, Omaya, and Maury, you can vote. People on Zoom, you can vote. Raise your hand or use the raise hand function. No, I want to vote, but I reacted late. Omaya, are you a yes vote or a no yes. vote? Yes. Yes. So yes. Oh, she carries. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. First uh, motion on your belt. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, and now let's do uh, um, let's do guidelines. The twenty three ten Queens Plaza South, and uh, yeah, I guess Christine, you're gonna be up here <laughs> for the rest of them. No, no, well, I have, yeah, I'll do, I'll do this, but I actually, uh, right, so. <laughs> oh, you read it. Right. Um, so the Arts and Culture Committee and the um, Land Use Committee have uh, worked extensively to, to finalize, sorry, to develop this draft guidelines document which would govern in the future this space that we have been um, promised, I mean, more than promised, committed to by the developer for 2310 Queens, Queens Plaza South. Wait, I have this already. Oh, same thing already. So, anyway, <laughs> um, I don't want to go through all the details. I think it's been a useful process. It's a pretty thorough document. It outlines, you know, the size of the space, um, the, that it's irrevocable, that, that the developer will foot the costs of the administration, the furnishing and the administrations of the space. And then I do just want to read briefly the mission because this was also part of the, uh, you know, some extensive conversation. The mission of this space is to meet the ongoing shared community space needs of Community Board 2 District and other neighboring areas as needed, prioritizing the accommodation and support of local arts, culture and community groups. This shall be, it should be a multi-purpose space for community benefit. It is intended for entities who neither own their own space in which to operate, nor have the budget to pay for leased space. Um, so the idea is that it is not a space for um, events which, all, all events shall be free and open to the public in the space and it shall, the use shall rotate so that there's, there's a kind of free, uh, you know, equitable shared access of the groups that need access to the space. In other words, a one-off event is, is okay, but you know, if you're gonna do a run of several weeks, that this is not the space. Um, and that the developer, the building owner will pay for the, will handle the, um, you know, the day-to-day -day maintenance of the space and will also um, 
essentially hire and enter into agreement with a local nonprofit who will then actually be responsible for the programming of the space and working with the groups who are going to use it. They will develop a, um, you know, a, 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 what is the right term? Um, you know, a document which outlines an understanding of how you're going to use the space and the guidelines for using the space that everybody would have to sign. Um, and then there's a, um, then there's some description of the build out and the, the um, you know, the types of furnishings uh, that, that the space would include, including we're asking for a sprung floor for dance, for an AV infrastructure, which would accommodate a variety of types of performances and accommodation and lighting, you know, a grid for flexible lighting, walls that are set up for, for um, flexible art exhibits. So, you know, we think we've tried to make it both tight and something that will, um, you know, be effective in the future because Right now, the space is unbuilt. They're still looking for a primary tenant. Realistically, it's, you know, minimum four years down the mine, five years. So what we're trying to do is set guidelines that will be effective. We did send this draft document to the, um, the council for the borough president, Alan Swisher, to ask him to review it because we're really concerned based on other experience that these kind of community community benefit commitments that developers make at the time of the Euler process are often kind of unenforceable <laughs> or that there, there's not an, a, you know, a clear enough um, legal legally binding agreement that get, that get, meets everybody's expectation when push comes to shove and they get realized. So, which was one reason for asking Alan to review it. He had no question, no real comments about the language. He thought that the language in this document was pretty tight, but that at, at the borough president's level, they are aware of this sort of legal gap <laughs> of enforcement for these community benefits. If you look online at the ULERP documents, we could not find any reference to any of this in the officially approved legal document, ULERP documents, although city planning tells us that it's somewhere. <laughs> so I guess what we're asking for tonight is just any question or the board's approval, which I think can just be a show of hands. And, um, and no, what, what, Sheila? Okay. No, no, no. No, I had my hand up before she had her hand up. Point of, point of, point of information, right? Yes, point of information. Um, well, there, there are just a, a couple of things and suggestions I had to, I, there's no ceiling height mentioned and I, under the specifications, and I think that's critically important if you're going to be using, uh, you know, video. Yeah, uh, so it's a double height space. I mean, just just by by virtue of the way it's designed, it's a double height space. I just think it should be mentioned in the criteria if it's okay. Because, because if you said this is going to be used moving forward, I I think that it's the kind of thing that's needed. Um, power needs as far as the amount of power that's needed if we're working with a yeah, lot of technology. I, think, okay. I, I looked at it. I didn't see that. Um, and then the where it says where it says um, that the what the maintenance costs and stuff for the life of the project. Can it just say in perpetuity? instead of life of the project, I just get concerned that there be, might be different definitions of the project um, that, that gets into that. And, and just to add, I think the uh, developer, I'm behind you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I remember the, the gist of it was he wanted it more permanent, right? Um, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, instead of the project just in perpetuity. And, and then instead of the developer in consultation with community board to so, shall select, that makes it sound like the, the community, like they, that gives the developer full authority and autonomy over selecting the nonprofit. And I just thought that maybe that's a place for like the borough president was talking about some kind of a advisory group as opposed to, because in the past, this has happened that someone will pick somebody because they like them. And then local groups who um, are really in need don't get selected because they're not as 
cool to be in their lobby or in their space. So, so I, I understand what you're saying, Sheila. I think that that starts to get into our our role as a community board legally being only advisory. And so that, you I know. I understand that, but that's so, why I was saying if something else could be here about, you know, so the developer is not given the full autonomy to just. Well, if it's not the developer and it's not the community board, who is it? I mean, I mean that, that's where there, I think there really is a legal gray area. Um, here. I think there is a, uh, that may fall under whoever that future tenant is and we should maybe we we can add that language to make sure we basically want to like remove as like we want to make sure that the control stays in the community so um yeah like i think if there's recommended language to just be super crystal clear for the future because we are setting this up for the future and we want to make sure it's a precedent that this space always stays in right. the control and, and the input of the community and one thing that is clearly outlined in this document is that the um the administrator that's hired would have to furnish um on whatever basis we want it quarterly you know semi-annually data about who's using it and how it's being used for the board's review um so can those be friendly that's amendments that's <laughs> Can those be friendly amendments that we just talked Absolutely. about? Absolutely. I mean, this oh, is <laughs> only, let me emphasize, this is a draft document. We just want the board's approval to get back in touch with the developer and, and sort of yeah. give it to them. I'm sure there's going to be more back and forth to them. And one of the things, suggestions that Anne Marie made, which I think is a strong one, is to ask that they now, they've provided an initial signed letter yeah. committing to this space, but asking that they provide an updated letter referencing this document or some version of it so that there's a tighter understanding going forward when the agreement you know when the building does happen but i, I took notes yeah for the next draft it should be yes yeah got it yep okay. so yeah i think lisa still made a motion i will accept that <laughs> i will accept that you made a motion i second it i second it <laughs> Any discussion? Any uh, discussion? No? Okay. Call the question. Show of hands. What was the question? What was the motion? To, to approve the draft. Uh, uh, yeah, to approve the letter as a draft. Two friendly amendments. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. So the friendly the friendly amendments discussed by Sh by Sheila and Krisha prior to the motion will be adopted as friendly amendments. Is that clear? That Anybody opposed. Any <laughs> now um, the ULERP. Right, the other two, two ULERP. Well, two, one, one ULERP and one, one special ULERP. <laughs> okay, the first ULERP is the Queens Midtown Expressway um, property, which is a rezone, which is an upzoning of the property, um, including both. And I don't know if this was fully described. Both the property owned by the proposer and one adjacent property, correct? Right. Um, what, I, what I don't have, and I was asking for Debbie is the exact vote, the, the Land Use Committee did vote to approve this application. I don't have the exact vote. Okay. So it was all in favor. Um, I think there were some additional questions raised tonight, which we can. Yes, Tom. The developer was open to the idea of investigating uh, additional green infrastructure yeah. to help mitigate water going into a sewer system that is already at capacity. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to include um, that the developer is a... looking at opportunities to include green infrastructure. Okay. Uh, Patrick? <laughs> Patrick? Oh. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking of the green infrastructure and how it's going to absorb, because I, I live there as well. It's where I jog on the other side of Zion. And um, I'm not really sure how much it's going to be, like the property will be able to do, because you're absorbing all the water from Massive Plateau down there at the bottom of uh, where, where it's located. So I'm not necessarily sure the addition or not is completely relevant and effective. And then to answer Laura's question earlier, um, there's plenty of cars parked around there because nobody lives around there and there's a couple of uh, car shops or uh, repair shops. Um, so I think that like the neighbors might be a uh, cause of those things that you're noticing. Just things I noted when you know, questions popped up and I live there and I don't know many others who are. So there you go. Is there a, someone, do we have a motion? Okay. Who seconded Danielle? So this has to be this over. Is a, this is a roll call. Okay. Uh, With the yes. stipulation. I'd like to make a friendly amendment or an amendment which the developer seemed open to, which is to mitigate um, water entering our sewer system by replacing some of the sidewalk with green infrastructure. Um, and, and also on site infrastructure. I mean, yes, you, somebody you. mentioned detention as well. With detention the tanks were mentioned okay. as well, yes. Do you accept oh, it? I accept it. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. On behalf of the committee, I accept it. I mean, it's. Okay, Impero Appleby. Yes. Nellie Ashfar. Nellie, you can uh, come off mute. Yes, you said yes, Nelly? Yes. Okay, great. Anatole Asheroff? Yes. John Mejia? Yes. Anne Marie Bakowski? Yes. Parisha Baton? Yes. Nick Berkowitz? Yes. Danielle Brecker? Yes. Carlos Castile Crook? Yes. Tanya Chavis? Yes. Osmond Chowdhury, absent. Stephen Cooper, absent. Kelly Gray, absent. Warren Davis? Yes. Lisa Della? Yes. Maury Gallinoy? Aye. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Roz Giannousis? Thank you. Camille Gray. Yes. Thank you. Kenny Greenberg. Yes. Christine Hunter. Yes. Leland Kindell. Bajran Khan. Yes. Prameet Kumar. Yes. Sheila Lewandowski. Yes. Benjamin Lucas. Absent. Patrick Martinez. Tom Matusis. Yes. Eric Narberg. Yes. Zisha Naat. Yes. Riley Owens. Yes. Omaya Saab. Yes. Thank you. Norberto Saldana. Yes. Laura Shepard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake in this line. Lauren Springer. <laughs> yes. Kunchak Tachi, absent, Agnello Thomas. It's a point of information. This also includes the green spaces that Tom was mentioning as well? Yes. Okay, yes. Mary Torres, is it? Leticia Velasquez. Vasquez, sorry. Okay, passes unanimously.
All right, and now uh, this last one. Um, there's 15 minutes of discussion on the clock. Let's try to stick to it, but I know it's a big one. Um, yeah. Um, just one thing that, that Bree did not mention, but I, I just, we thought the full board should know, and it's, it's quite sad for the board, um, I think from our perspective, is that both Alexis Wheeler and um, Teal, right, Teal Dallas uh, have um, left the department, and we're going to really miss them. Um, yeah. It, it sort of, I guess it was a sort of series of unfortunate, you know, coincidences that several people left at once, but it really leaves, you know, CB2, I think, with, with a lack of, um, you know, people, with a lack of continuity and people who were aware of this sort of long and, and uh, you know, long history of land use efforts and land use changes and, um, in this area, so it's a matter of concern. Although we welcome Bree, and and um, you know, hope that we can continue a good relationship, you know, and a strong relationship with city planning going forward. Okay. No, uh, second. Oh, oh, did we did we miss you for? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Debbie uh, Hosen was here. He was here when attendance was called. And then we, I think we missed him. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yes on everything? Or <laughs> yes on all the prior three votes. Not, I'm not, you know, no, no, I'm not proxy voting. I'm just correcting what, <laughs> what you said. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark, if you can restart it to 15 minutes. Um, I know it's a big one. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'll, I'll be a bit more lenient about this one, but, uh, and I know it's a, uh, yes, let's summarize, then we can, uh, point of information and, uh, you know, motion in the discussion. Well, I, I mean, the summary is brief. I think we're being asked to approve the, the expansion of the bid in two direct, you know, two separate sub-districts. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I need water. I'm um, going forward, anyway. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the summary. <laughs> what else? Well, the only other thing is that uh, Mike first. So, Mike did. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, all were in favor of the motion with one opposed and no abstentions. Thank you for me. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, the, there was a note that says we want a stipulation for more participation by tenants. Right. Uh, of the new east expansion zone. So we uh, originally, I, and I was the one that asked for this, asked for more representation on the board, on the sub board, and then and we were told by the woman from the um, city, yeah. SBA, yeah, small business services, that the way the legislation is written, this seems really, is that there's a one to seven ratio specified of tenants to owners or to, to pro representation of property owners, so that if we had, you know, asked for three tenant representatives, then you'd have to have 21 um, other representatives, which everyone agreed was poorly written legislation, but there you have it. So then we just asked for greater representation in a more general way. Yes, Sheila. I'm sorry, there's just such legalese around that that it's just making me itch is that every one of the property owners, the large property owners, has an office in their building. So they technically are tenants in addition to being representatives of property owners. So I'm just saying, like skipping around the language, it was created at a time where we didn't have the kind of global um, developers like we do now. So I'm not you, I'm just taking issue with the, with their, the dancing around, uh, you, you know, the need for, the legislation needs to change, the structure needs to change. And, and, and so I'm, I'm just having trouble like supporting something that is not changing. They're taking advantage of the times changing that the neighborhood is not blighted and using the same legislation that was written for a different time and a different place. So, I, you know, I'm sorry, I just was- No, I, I hear you. <laughs> Do you have ratios how many buildings and how many small businesses are with them? Can someone answer that? 
No? Yeah. Well, do we, do we, so following other procedure, do we want to ask for a motion now and then? Yes. Have stipulations? So is there a motion? Does someone want to make a motion? I'm We're so not clear. That's why I want to ask these questions. So I think, I don't know if everyone is clear on what they're actually doing and how many small businesses are participating, how many buildings are, sub, like, that's the question I want to know. Out of the area, how many businesses, or give me a ratio, okay. or how many buildings, how many small businesses, and I know Sheila just said one of the tenants is part of the big building, so that's my questions. Yeah. I think we need to get the motion first before we get, so let's click. Did you hand up? Sorry. Just for the motion, I think you take it back. Who made the motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the bid expansion as written with the stipulations agreed on in the land use meeting. I already asked the question. So I, oh, sorry. So the question. So out of the um, in the East expansion, there's 139 properties and 150 commercial businesses. On the West Expansion, there's uh, 170 properties and 291 businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, can, am I allowed to give a point of clarification to Sheila's? So the bid enabling legislation, the bid law states that um, there, if, so if you, you can be a property owner and a tenant, but you have to, by law, if you're a property owner and a tenant, you have to be class A, so you can't own property and be a tenant and then be, represent the tenants. So the tenants are a separate class than the property owners. They're counted as property owners. Yeah, they're not counted as and, tenants. And I'm just, yeah, but they're both. So the, yeah, I'm getting where we're getting into the legalese. That's part of my frustration with it, is that it doesn't change. They're like, you know, it's not changed with the times. Yeah, uh, on the, the, I think there was also a, the woman from SBS misunderstood. So when she said the seven to one, so, the minimum number of board seats that you can have is 13, and that's because the majority has to be property owners by the bid law. So with the four elected officials, the one commercial tenant and the one resident that makes six, so then seven has to be property owners. The only thing that the law actually says is that the majority has to be property owners, at least one tenant, at least one resident, and then the four elected officials are all the voting board, and then we have more tenants than is required, um, but that's that's how it works. But yes, the bid the bid enabling legislation was established in like 1984 or something in Albany. So that's you know something that we could maybe change, but not <laughs> right now. I, I have a, I have a question. Hey, uh, when this subject came up before uh, the bid, a few meetings passed. Uh, my initial reaction was I was very concerned about the small businesses and the assessments and so on. And I was very much satisfied by the answer that you or whoever gave at the time that the assessments on most of the small businesses were really very, very small. I mean, a few hundred dollars or something. Has anything changed? As far as the assessments note, so the assessment is um, extremely low. And another point I wanted to make is a lot of the larger property owners are already, they, they have the resources to have like the in-house sanitation people, the in-house ma maintenance people that are sweeping outside. But the smaller property owners don't necessarily have that. So you can kind of think of it as like the way that the assessment formula works, the larger owners are subsidizing the smaller owners um, because it's based on assessed value and square footage. And the average assessment, I can just tell you to answer that question, the, the median assessment um, for the property owners is $590 annually. Um, and that's for the property owners, and then that gets divided by the tenants. So it is about, you know, a few, a few hundred dollars a year based on the square footage. Um, 
as the one member of land use that voted no, I will just state why. I don't believe in bids. I don't think that we should be giving up what government should be doing to a bid that does not represent and is not controlled by the electives that we voted for to do the work that we as taxpayers are paying money for government to do. That's my opinion. I know you don't all agree. That's fine. But the other thing that I just, I actually just lost my train of thought, but that is my point of view and I will be voting no tonight and I encourage others to do the same. Uh, Maury, remember the weight rule. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, what I wanted to do is just kind of address what um, uh, Dr. Rods had pointed out. I think it's one of the challenges with the idea of the bid uh, to go, you know, Sheila points out that it's like kind of an archaic law and it hasn't kept up with the times. These aren't blighted areas. Um, and then this idea of oh, but it's not that much the assessment, it's not gonna really affect. One of the big effects, and that's why uh, 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 Jackson Heights voted it down, uh, was ultimately what happens is rents go up, small businesses get affected, then they can't afford rent. So what you wind up with is the big box stores, the big chain stores, everybody's complaining about you know, all we have is, you know, banks on the corners and New York City has changed so much. We haven't, we don't have uh, mom and pop shops anymore. This is one of the reasons why, because we went from trying to fix blighted areas to uh, over gentrifying areas and displacing people. I too will be voting against because I don't think the bid has done a good job convincing me uh, that they're going to do anything that this a the city should be already doing and that the community board itself already is doing. Um, I just I just don't see it, and I think it's premature. And I actually would like to make a motion to table this vote. I would like to table it until we've had uh, an opportunity. I know we've you know, continued this for a while, but I would like to table this because I think the community deserves to have a public hearing, not as part of another meeting, not as a committee meeting, and not as uh, enveloped in our regular board meeting when there's a lot of stuff going on and we're tired and busy and, 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 and there's so much else to vote on. I think we should have a big public uh, uh, hearing where we solicit as many small businesses and public to come to the meeting on a separate day and event um, and not just go by the cherry picked small businesses that the bid who has a vested interest in presenting their view, um, I think you know to no no fault of their own. They, this is obviously what they're doing. We have to do our job and represent the community. And I move to table the vote under the condition that we have a public hearing solely for this. Do I have a second? I second. Then we have to vote because it's a table vote. Can't hear anything. Do we lose the audio? In this process, there's nothing that uh, that we can say. Uh, was uh, no, I think a time, uh, someone online That's seconded. No audio. Tanya seconded. Tanya seconded it. Okay. Um, question. Uh, sorry, point of information. Uh, yeah. So tabling overrules other motions. So now we have to uh, address this, and um, depending on how this goes, we can go back to the other motion. So is it a roll call or? Uh, the, yeah, the motion to table. Yeah, yeah, so now we have to uh, address the motion that's on the floor. No. No, we have, we have to vote on the, the whether we... 
Yeah, we, we vote whether we, or not we table it. So is, is that a roll call? We, roll call? Uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he told me separately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I think it's roll call vote. And the roll call is to table. To table. Right. Not to table. So no is don't table. Yes, yes is to table. Um, yes is to table. No is to not table. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the like like Lisa. Um, uh, so there is a thirty day review time period for this uh, community board right the 30 days the city planning commission was yesterday i think that's right right city planning commission but what city planning told us is that they would accept or you know if it was a day late that they would accept our opinion submitted um late so but we need to vote because we only have 30 days to review so if we don't vote We don't have a no vote or we don't have a yes vote. Right, but we, so other options, if we don't vote to table, would be to have a different vote to say no. Or, or yes. Say yes, yes. Correct. Yes, correct. Yes, that's it. Right, those are the options. Either you table and there's nothing. Vote no and then have a different vote to vote no. Correct, right, yes. Right, correct. There is no more. Right. <laughs> All right, let's let, let's do this, uh, Debbie. Okay, roll call vote. Paro Appleby. No. Nellie Ashfar. No. Anatole Asheroff. No. John Bahia. No. Anne Marie Benkowski. Harisha Baton? No. Nick Berkowitz? Yes. Danielle Brecker? Carlos Castile Croak? No. Tanya Chavis? Debbie, we keep on losing audio. I don't know if that's happening to everyone else. Tanya, are you voting yes or no to table? Um, yes. Warren Davis. Lisa Della. Maury Gallinoy. No. <laughs> Dr. Raj Giannousis. We're on a time frame, folks. Raj Giannousis. Thank you. Camille Bray. Kenny Greenberg. Christine Hunter. No. Mohammed Hosen. No. Leland Kendell. Bedrun Khan. Pramit Kumar. Sheila Lewandowski. Patrick Martinez. Tom Matusitz. No. Eric Narberg. Z. Shanat, Riley Owens, Omaya Saab. No, no. Nabert, thank you. Nabertha Sedana. Nabertha? No. Laura Shepard? No. Lauren Springer? Agnello Thomas? Leticia Vasquez? Okay, motion carries. Okay, so we're now back to the motion, motion, the motion failed. The motion to table failed. Now there has to be another motion on the table. No, there already is one. Let's go back to the No, no, no. That motion's no longer, so you have to start over. So now you have to have a new motion. No, you don't have to have a new motion. Okay. 
Because the t motion to table inter interjects. What Nick said before. Just just make that motion again, please. Someone. <laughs> well, just restate the motion. I, I, I'm making a motion to approve the bid as described and as and with the stipulations agreed to. Okay. All right. So it's Nick and Ross. And I was next Ten minutes of discussion, then I'm cutting it off for voting. The stipulation was to increase the participation on the board. Sorry, to increase the participation of tenant represent or to increase the representation of tenants on the board. And now that it's been clarified by Laura that in fact what the woman from SBS said was not quite accurate, I think we can just leave that language to increase the representation of tenants on the board. Yeah. Only if so, we want to. I mean. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I intend to support this motion. Um, and I, what? No, I know. I'm making, I'm, I'm explaining why I made the motion. Um, this is discussion, right? Is this kosher? I'm discussing my motion. Okay. So um, I think that the bid is, I, I deeply respect the uh, opinions of my colleagues, Maury and Danielle, on, on philosophical differences with the bid. But these are the organizations that we currently have in this district. It is a pathway to get large amounts of dollars into our community. And it does not supplant the city's efforts. And so ultimately, this is, these are the tools we have. This is going to make this, better, this district better. I also think the one major disagreement I have with Maury is that gentrification is a multi-determined process, and this is not going to make the difference in that. There's lots of other things going on here. Um, I think we've gotten a little bit carried away in blaming just these institutions for that effort. All that said, I urge everybody Read to support the, research. The, um, support the motion. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I agree with what Nick just said, and I'm also going to point out that the bid expansion area includes the area around LaGuardia Community College where 14,000 students and faculty members have a pretty miserable commute every day, walking, uh, biking, and taking transit to class, and if this, if this can make their lives any better with better streetscapes, uh, improvements, sanitation, lighting, whatnot, um, having heard from the small business owners that support it, um, we'll never hear from all the shelter residents in the area um, who ought to also benefit from these things. I think in the short term, if this is going to make people's lives better in meaningful ways, we should go for it. I'll just add on very quickly, I think I'm going to say similar things. If we vote no, basically what we're saying is that we don't want there to be extra sanitation in these areas. We don't want there to be holiday lighting in these areas, because if the bid doesn't do it, no one else is going to come and do it. It would be great if the city did it, but the reason the bid exists and it's popular is that the city is not doing it. So at least in the short term, uh, let's you know give the businesses in the area what they want. They want sanitation. They want lights. Let's listen to them and say yes. Um, why am I talking? I am talking to uh, um, reinforce uh, what Laura and, and Gramit have said. And uh, yeah, um, people need these services now. Uh, we can wait around until you know a future administration pulls up. We can advocate till we go, or blue in the face. Which uh, yes, yes, and we can advocate. Uh, now and we can, you know, we can advocate for, you know, we can, we can advocate, but, um, but in the meantime, people need help, and that's my view on it. Carisha. Yeah, I, I also hear my colleagues' concern about just the philosophy of a bid. I, I hear what everybody's saying about our current situation that we're sort of pressed up against now with the time frame. Um, I, it would have been great to have a public hearing, um, but I think having an opinion is better than not having us uh, have an opinion at all. 
uh, I'd like to see this as an opportunity to hold the bid accountable to our uh, expectations if this does go forward, as well as working even more closely together with the bid to make um, advocacy for our city agencies to, to step up um, in, in tandem with the services that the bid will be planning to do for those areas that are not being served at all. Um, I think this is also a great opportunity for our board, for a small business committee to be active towards this effort in partnership with, with land use, in partnership with transportation to talk about the things like lighting and sanitation. Um, so there is a lot of things that we can still do um, even if this expansion goes forward and, and also with the concern with reaching out to the businesses that um, haven't been contacted or, or haven't been able to, um, I don't know, I just, I just think that there's definitely opportunity to continue to do this. Um, yeah, I, 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 whenever anyone says to me, well, let's just support the structures that exist um, because there's not another way to do it. I, it really rubs me the wrong way because think about so many things that have been legal in our lives and even the borough president referred to some of them um, that we can just say, well, that's the way it is. Uh, and I'm not, I, I, I can't just go by that. I do believe in advocacy. And sometimes voting something down is part of sending a message. In the end, this will probably go through anyway. And so this board has to decide what kind of message are we sending um, about utilizing structures for 70 years. The same structure, even though the community has changed, um, the economy has changed, the demographics have changed. I'd like to know how many non-English speaking people there are on that board. Um, you, know, you know, I just, or, or immigrants, uh, recent immigrants, um, they, they should be represented. Uh, and so I, you know, so I'm just, I, I don't think we should ever just say this is the way it is and, and find and just say, we'll deal with that. We do have to find a way to survive within a system that exists that I'm just going to say all the catchwords that is patriarchal, that is col colonialist, that is all of these things, and fight them to change things as well. Um, so, two minutes. Uh, wait, before we go to Maury, and Maury, remember you have one minute when we get to you. Do you have the? An do you know how, the answer to Sheila's question? How many immigrants, non-English speakers? So yeah, so um, the especially the tenants on our board are representative of the neighborhood. So we have, I would say, most of them are recent immigrants. Um, English is not their second language, is not their first language, um, because it's a reflection of the neighborhood. And we're always looking for new board members. So if you have suggestions on new tenants that should participate, like we're happy to have more. We want more participation. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you know which? <laughs> Sorry, uh, Maury, you have one minute. Yep. Okay. <laughs> one, Thirty um, seconds. Okay, a couple of things really quickly. Um, first of all, we are. I voted against my own motion to table because it became. Uh, I became aware of the 30-day issue, and I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to vote. I'm not. I'm not. Um, you know, um, going to sabotage the the board's ability to vote. Um, I think it's really important to remember, like Sheila said, we are advisory, and as an advisory, yes, it might likely pass. But in our advisory role, we have an opportunity to uh, talk about what the community uh, sees as good or bad. But we also have an opportunity to fix where we may be messed up by not having a big open public meeting uh, where more people could come and be involved and focus on this issue alone. 
There is a precedent for CBs voting against expansions. And remember, this is not a revocation. I think what my colleague Laura had said before was making it sound like we're revoking it or what um, Nick had said. This is, we're voting on whether they should expand and expand it to areas that don't even have a lot of businesses yet. And I think, you know, we really, I urge you all to vote against this. If it's our fault as a community board for not having a bigger public meeting where more small businesses could get involved, look, I'm a small business owner. I'm a third generation small business owner, mom and pop size, not the legal definition of small business of 500 or fewer employees, of which, um, you know, a lot of the so-called small businesses are in that area. Um, I'm now the... Uh, uh, chair of the small business committee i believe and support in small businesses i don't want to hurt them and i don't want to hurt our small families and i think we need to vote against this at this time right on time and also uh, thank you for announcing you're accepting chair of small business committee <laughs> yay congratulations right, yeah. sorry i already did sorry all right we are time's up let's do this uh, we, we, it's been, call the question, all right, roll call. The motion is to support the Long Island City Business Improvement District expansion with the friendly amendment to increase tenants on the board. On the east side, okay. A yes is to support it, a no is not to support it. Ampero Appleby. Yes. <laughs> Nellie Ashford. Yes. Anatole Asheroff. Yes. John Bahia. No. Anne Marie Bankowski. Carisha Baton, Nick Berkowitz, Daniel Brecker, Carlos Castile Croak, Tanya Chavez. Yes. She said yes. Warren Davis, Lisa Della, Maury Gallinoy. Uh, no. Dr. Rosamond Giannosis. Camille Gray. Kenny Greenberg. Station. Mohammed Hosen. Christine Hunter. Yes. Leland Kendell. Bedrun Gan. Pramit Kumar. Sheila Lewandowski, Patrick Martinez, Tom Matusitz, Eric Narberg, Zishanat, Riley Owens, Omaya Saab. No. Naberto Saldana, Laura Shepard, Lauren Springer, Ignello Thomas. Yes. Leticia Vasquez. Twenty in favor. Twelve no. One abstention. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, everyone. With exactly one minute left to spare. That's a record. <laughs> Sheila, <laughs> Christine seconded, and we made hybrid work too. Um, just as a reminder, it's because we got the quorum in person we were able to do this. Let's hope we 
uh, rotate who gets to be on Zoom. Let's make it fair. And uh, yeah, let's do this again next month. Thank you so much.